Today, I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Swan Private. Now, you know from listening to this show that our money is broken. Fortunately, we have Bitcoin, a better money that will help us build a brighter future. But if you don't have a Bitcoin strategy and a trusted partner to help you execute that strategy, then you're probably going to fall behind. Now, I've known the Swan Bitcoin team for years. The Bitcoiners at Swan are mission driven and have deep expertise and respect in the Bitcoin space. In my opinion, this is the team you want on your side. Today, I'd like to highlight Swan's private client services division, which guides high net worth individuals and businesses around the world toward building and preserving wealth with Bitcoin. So visit swanprivate.com and learn how this concierge service gives you direct access to your dedicated Bitcoin advisor by phone, messaging, and email. Swan will guide you on complex areas such as self-custody, or you can choose to hold your Bitcoin through Swan with one of the largest U.S. regulated custodians. So make your first purchase with Swan Private and get $100 of Bitcoin. Just tell them that I sent you. You know, an opportunity like this to build and preserve legacy impacting wealth for your family and company will not likely be seen again in our lifetimes. Sign up at swanprivate.com today, mention breed love to your advisor and get $100 in free Bitcoin when you make your first buy. John Ravicki, welcome back. We are continuing our series on the book by DC Schindler, um, Plato's Critique of Impure Reason. So I'm to make sure I got the author's name correctly and it is correct. It is and DC Schindler. Yes. DC Schindler. And Diving into the second chapter today, which is titled With Good Reason. Mm -hmm. And as you said offline to me, this is the pivotal chapter of the book. Yes. Um, ties together a lot of very important concepts. So I'm going to start just reading this brief excerpt um, on Plato's basic statements about mm -hmm. the nature of the good. And Schindler writes... Over the course of the digression that occupies the dialogue's middle books, in, in reference to Plato's Republic, Plato makes a series of basic statements regarding the nature of the good. It is not only the foundation of truth, but it is also the cause of the existence of all things and the goal of all human action. Now, that last one really strikes me, the goal of all human action. I think I mentioned yes. this to you yesterday, but again, in Austrian economics, they say all human action is an expression of value, whatever your highest value is in your internalized value hierarchy. That's what you're doing in any one moment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the simple way to say that is to walk from one side of the room to the other implies or expresses that you value being on the other side of the room than you do being in your, your present position. And um, the other thing that struck me here, just on things that I've read and talked about on the show is, um, and I, I know I've mentioned the book to you, Leela by Robert Persig. Of course. And, and not to ruin the book, but I don't think it would be ruining it for you per se, but his punchline at the end of that book is that the good is a noun rather than an adjective. And yes. so it just, it struck me here that Plato described his, his three basic statements on the nature of good are nouns, basically saying that it is the foundation of truth, cause of all existence, the existence of, of all things and the goal of all human action. Um, so is there, maybe you could just elaborate on whatever connection there is between, I guess, value in the sense of human action and goodness. Um, right. And how that... <laughs> I guess how, you know, we typically, I think most people's mindset typically is that good is an adjective. I think I'm choosing the right word here where it's a, you are. That, that's it's a good car, good. that's a good dress, yeah, yeah. good food, yeah. Yeah. but there's kind of a, uh, an inversion here of some kind where good is actually more of a noun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, it's hard to do this without you know, getting into the depths of it right away. So, um, but and by the way, thank you for making the connection to Persig. Uh, Sevilla King, and uh, who christened the term this little corner of the internet, is constantly carrying on this very helpful dialogue on her channel. 
between the Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance and Lila, Persig's work and a lot of the stuff that work I'm doing. And, the, you know, and Persig has this very interesting, almost ambivalent relationship with Plato. Um, that's a really uh, important subtext of the book. So uh, just, just as a help to the audience, um, you making that connection, I think, is, is, very, is, is very good <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to, quote, to quote a word. Um, now, wh why a noun? Because, um, well, let's, let's, first of all, let's go, let's make the connection you wanted to make between value and um, goodness. So value is, is a term that came out of, you know, uh, in the sense you're using it as a term that came out of modernity, uh, was given a, a special uh, sort of central role in Nietzsche, the Ubermensch is the, is the being that can engage in the transvaluing of all values and all that stuff. Um, but a way to do it might be to back out of that term and try to connect it to something that's in Plato, which is these two notions of love and desire. And so one way of thinking of how to connect um, value to what Plato's talking about is to desire something it right, can, can, contains within it what you might call a cognitive judgment. Um, and the cognitive judgment is that it is in somehow good. It is in some way good. Um, so when I desire water, I desire it because I think it to be good in some way. Now, it might be purely instrumental. It's good for quenching my thirst or it's good for keeping me alive. Or I might desire something that has, uh, that's good in its, for its own sake. Like I desire to listen to the Ninth Symphony by Beethoven. Uh, in, in, uh, because I just find it, uh, it, that experience is just an intrinsically good experience. And so, and then of course, love means something, and we'll get into this as we go through chapter two, it means something beyond desire. The problem I have with the word value is it tends to sort of, in, it, it tends to maybe even potentially conflate all of these things that we might want to distinguish from each other. I can get up and cross the room because I desire to do so. I can get, across, get, get up and cross the room because I fear to do so. I can get up and cross the room uh, because I love to do so. Like there's all these different things. And, and so the cognitive aspect of it, it um, tends to be lost to some degree in the term value. Um, because I think perhaps, uh, and this is a, this is a, 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 a supposition on my part. I think perhaps what the economists were doing, were trying to find something um, sort of a, as a unifying term for many kinds of ways in which people are motivated towards some goal um, that, that they could then use within their economic theorizing. So I'm not, I'm not challenging their use of the term, but what I'm trying to say is, I think what we wanna do if we wanna understand Schindler's argument is we have to take that single term and break it back up. And then what we do is we get two poles, which are central to chapter two. We get what you might call a, 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 a cognitive conative pole, how you are sort of judging and orienting yourself towards something. And then also what you might wanna call right, uh, uh, the objective pole in, in the sense of what it is about the object that makes a, that a, such a relationship to it actually possible for you. Uh, so presumably you live for, just to hopefully choose a non-controversial example, you live in a world in, right, in, with a particular body that means you have sets of desires that pick up on properties in the environment that might be different from a bat's right, set of ways in which Right, so there's features of its environment and its biology that fit it and create affordances for interaction, right? And so that's why I think stepping out of the term value, again, I'm not, I, I'm not making any argument against its use in economic theory, but I'm saying if we want to understand Schindler's argument, we step out and then we open it up and we have desire and love and things like this, the, the cognitive canative pole, and then we have the features of the thing that make sense of that and the two fit together via intelligibility in some important sense. So I hope that was helpful. That is quite helpful. Um, this is a bit of a tangent perhaps, but 
Would you mind expanding on the, and this is again, a tangent to the book even, but I've always often just wondered about what, if any connection there is between something like say economic value, moral value, intellectual value. Like what is the through, why are we, what is the through line for value itself? Well, I mean, once you do what I suggested, I think you can apply Schindler's argument to it, uh, which is um, what you're doing is pointing to the good within those various domains. And, and, and you have to integrate that with what we talked about last time, which is this notion of the good is that that you, that you get up by seeing through ethical goodness and aesthetic goodness and epistemic goodness, right? And what you're trying to do is you're trying to see sort of the foundational ontological goodness. So I would say that there's a combination of two things in a sense like intellectual uh, value or economic value. There's a sense in which we're trying to point to a way in which we're, we're appropriately fitted to reality. And we're gonna to have to cash that out and make more sense of that in all of these domains. And then how, but then we're doing, so we're doing something that's general in that sense. But then what, what I think we're doing is we're then also doing something specific to each domain, which is how does that general fittedness actually, right? Work with it, make, how is it good? How, does, how is it specified so that it is good for the economy or economic behavior or good for the intellect or intellectual behavior. And so in that way, and the philosophers are, are knowing that I'm trying to stitch together Plato and Aristotle here, um, which of course is a, a project of all Neoplatonism. Um, but I, that's how I would try to answer your question. Excellent. So it's back to this, I mean, fitness to choose a purely scientific term. I, I don't know if it's purely scientific, but at least in a Darwinian sense, fitness is a pretty strongly scientific term. That's something that closely approximates value or goodness in these domains, that there's a fitness? Yes, yes, yes. yes. And, and that that fittedness is somehow simultaneously, and I'm trying to use these words very carefully, but also with some sort of, you know, connotation beyond their strict denotation that that fitness is somehow true to the world but also true to you uh, and, and it truths the two of you together um, in a way so it's not just like you're fitted to the environment and the environment is tyrannical over you and it's not that you're fitted to the environment and you're tyrannical over it and this is why all the metaphors of coupling and love are coming out you're fitted to each other in a way that's affording reciprocal opening or what Plato calls anagoge. Got it. Okay. The reciprocal opening is anagoge. Um, uh, the, sorry, one last question on this and we'll move on. But is this related at all to the procession and, and reversion? And that in the yes. act of fitting yourself to the environment, there's some procession or expression, but it's yes, also yes, pushing yes, back yes. on you. So there's a reversion. Yes, yes. Yes. You can see. So now you're referring to the platonic notion. Uh, but you can see the idea that this, that the good in some sense differentiates itself, right? So, it, and, and let's use the analogy you've been using. It's a good analogy. Let's remember it's an analogy, but it's a good, strong analogy. The way sort of uh, adaptivity is specified into all these different ways, morphologies of an organism, but nevertheless, there is one universal process, evolution, uh, by which adaptivity, right, it, it, it is and is understood, right, right. So, so it it it, it gives you the th what's 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 the through line of all these organisms? Well, they don't they don't the same shape. You know, I make this argument all the time, right. But not, nevertheless, what they're doing is an instantiation, a particular instance of that uh, adaptability, and they are all within a universal, like. Uh, through line, a, a, a something that integrates them and makes them all intelligible individually and together, which is the theory of evolution, which both is the thing that causes evolution, not the theory, evolution causes, but also makes adaptivity understandable to us. If you try to understand adaptivity without evolution, you have, a, well, you're, you're, you're into perhaps something like intelligent design, right? 
But what evolution does is it, it, it both causes and makes knowable to us what adaptivity is. And so you can see you know, the, the, the procession out and then the return. Did that help? It does a lot. And then um, what came up for me there is that he, so the universal process of evolution or adaptivity becomes expressed in this multiplicity of organisms. Yeah. And again, I'm just mapping that back onto economics. There's the universal market process that becomes expressed in this multiplicity of goods. Of course, we call them goods. What else would we call them? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and that, that also seems to be an ongoing process of like, you know, fitness experimentation, you know, certain technologies work for a while for a certain telios or purpose and then something better comes along yes um so yeah it's yeah processual again i i guess would be the term okay i'm jumping to page 89 actually here and um i'll read this excerpts it says accordingly aristotle recognizes only two senses of good one things that are good in themselves and two, things good as a means to those yes. compared to Plato's three categories. Yes. Aristotle's view effectively separates the senses of goodness into a sharp dichotomy. We choose a thing either because it is intrinsically good or because it is instrumentally good. Yes. Um, and so this reminds me of a couple of things i guess the, the again through economic lens you'd say like capital is the the means to the end right whereas cons consumables are the end like we we produce in order to consume ultimately right. but there there tend to be a lot of things like to make your you know jar of water you want to drink there are many pieces of equipment and machinery and factories and all these things all these pieces of capital that go into producing this consumable yeah. And I'm also reminded of just like the American pragmatists. They talk about, I think they call it instrumental truth, actually, maybe pragmatic truth, where it's yes. um, true enough to be useful. Yes. So the common example that I mentioned here, and I don't know which American pragmatist I lifted this or synthesized this from, but if a map successfully gets you from A to B, is that because the map is true or because the map is useful? Like it becomes really hard to disentangle. Yes, the utility yes. from the pra pragmatic or instrumental truth, I guess you would say. Um, so, yeah, I, I would just love to hear your thoughts on that. I guess um, distinguishing sure. in intrinsic goodness from instrumental goodness and how the, the, the difference between Plato and Aristotle on this topic. Yes. And, I, and I'm going to, and this is where I'd be good with Dan was here because uh, um, Dan likes, uh, Dan, Dan is, loves Plato, but he also loves Aristotle. Um, I respect Aristotle and find him important, but I love Plato. And so I'm, I'm biased. Um, so uh, I, I want people to note that. Um, although as a Neoplatonist, I, I, I try to really deeply integrate them together. Um, so the first thing to note is a point we made last time that Aristotle reduces everything to the non-contradiction of logic, a purely formal, move, right? Whereas Plato is trying to give us some contentful uh, notion of it, contentful notion of, uh, of, of, of what the absolute is. Um, and so I think the way Aristotle can be perhaps accused of initiating the reduction of logos to logic, I think that, re that move is also causing him to reduce the good. Um, to a dichotomous um, distinction. Um, now, I think it's a useful distinction. I mean, he's 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 bloody Aristotle, right? Is that right? So you're up against you know a universal genius. It's, nothing he does is like there's nothing he does that should be dismissed or, or neglected. But I, the idea that there are right these two exhaustive categories. There's instrumental goods. Uh, they are good for getting us to something that is the end of any you know, action on our part, which is something that's intrinsically good. Um, so, you know, your house helps to shelter you and your beloved, but you're in, but being in relationship with your beloved is not something you do for anything else. 
you do it for its own sake. Um, and that's interesting uh, uh, and, and it's really relevant because there are things that are, we, we often treat them in a purely instrumental fashion. But it, it, notice uh, Kant made it, uh, you know, he said there are um, the categorical, one way of interpreting the categorical imperative is that people are never a means only, but also a good in themselves. So we all, and this is, this, this is gonna help me make Plato's point. People are obviously instrumentally good to us. I mean, Castaway shows you that, right? It shows you how much we depend. But Castaway also shows the movie with Tom Hanks also shows yeah. you something else. Being with other people, it, people are also right in, in, intrinsically good. This is one of the. This is sort of the central claim of morality, and this is what Kant is trying to argue. Now, what do we? How do we relate to people and the goodness of people? Aristotle says we have to choose the one way or the other. But Plato says, well, often, and then he's, go I'm going to expand this out, we are doing both. And then Plato makes this bold claim that's not available to Aristotle because of his logical economy, which is that which can do both, right? That which is good in itself and good in relation to me, because that's what instrumental goodness means, is the best or the greatest good. And when you think about it, right, and, 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 and you know, think about somebody you love, right? They are very good for you. You'll say things like to the, you're perfect for me. You're, you're good for me. Like you you bring out the best in me. That's an instrumental goodness. And, and we don't think of that as an insult. We think of that as an expression. Of, but we also want the entity, if I can use a neutral term, that is doing that for us to also be something that we find intrinsically good. Right, so you don't want the thing that's instrumentally good to you to not also be good. Like, let me make this concrete. You've got this person and they're draw they're really good for you, but you know that they're evil, right? That's problematic for you. That's problematic for you, right? Similarly, if you were to have somebody and you think of them as sort of good in themselves, but you can't, you couldn't come any into any relationship with them then it'd be very hard for, for that goodness to make a difference to you or to call you call to you in some manner. And so I think Plato's argument is, is powerful that what he's trying to say is, right, when you're really relating to the good, you want that which is both good for you and that you judge to be good in and of itself. So think about how great music does this. Great music uplifts you, perhaps. That's how it's good for you. It makes you think or reflect. But you, you know it does that because it's a masterpiece or it has this, these intrinsic qualities that you think, right, make it worth keeping in existence even if you were not here. See, that, that's part of the test. Would you want that to still exist even if you were not here? I can say without hesitation, I want the Ninth Symphony to exist even if I disappear. But I also want the Ninth Symphony to do what it, keep doing what it does, which is uplift me and move me. And I think Plato is deeply right here that the good is that, with, right? So there's the three categories. And the third category, that which is both good for me and is good in and of itself, is the, is the best or the greatest kind of good. Did that help? That's very, very helpful, especially the music yeah. the piece where, yeah, you want something to persist beyond yourself, to have life yes. beyond yourself, even that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'll read another quick excerpt here too, on the same topic. Schindler writes, to put the issue in more technical terms, we could say that both Plato and Aristotle distinguish between goodness in an absolute sense, in itself, yes. as you said, yes. yep. and in a relative sense, which is in relation to an extraneous benefit, enjoying the music, for instance. Yes. But that Plato goes on to designate a third sense of goodness that is absolute in a manner inclusive of, rather than exclusive of, the relative. Yeah, and, and that's exactly what I was trying to do with the music example. Yes, yes. Yeah. So it's... it's um, 
where again you have the the absolute that transcends the relative but this means that it includes it, it, transcendence yes. does not entail exclusion this was a big exactly wake up exactly. call for me personally it's like oh wow it's not a dichotomy <laughs> It's, a, it's like a, uh, like we talked about yesterday with the sphere going through the page. It's another dimension yes. almost, the ecstatic yes. dimension, perhaps. Yes. Yes. And is yes. this, um, I couldn't help but tie this to, because another thing in Leela is, well, both Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance and Leela is he's getting after Plato's subject object metaphysics, yes. which yes. seems tightly related to this dichotomy. But Plato's identifying this transcendent third, which I think. Yes we'd call transjective in your terminology. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, so I'd just love to hear your thoughts on that. Okay, well, that's a different thing. And, and uh, you know, Sevilla and I have gone back and forth on this. I've also talked to Christopher, Master Pietro on this. Um, I think, <laughs> but I hope this doesn't piss a lot of people off, uh, especially Sevilla's uh, uh, following, because I, I deeply, uh, I have a lot of affection and respect for Sevilla and what she's doing. But I think, Percy gets Plato wrong in some central ways. Um, I think he often is reading Plato through a scholastic Aristotelian lens. That is a in some is a misreading of Plato. Now, is Percy responding to a way Plato has been traditionally presented in the academy? Yes, he is. But is that a response to Plato or to a tradition of really making Plato into Aristotle rather than? relating to Plato as Plato. Yes, I think that's also the case. So he should so, have wrote Schindler. Well, and that would be unfair to Persig because, right. you know, he's writing before all of this. Uh, and, uh, and, but, and, you know, Persig knows that he's got this ambivalent relationship to Plato. That's why, you know, the, the, the character in Zen is named Phaedrus, which is, of course, one of the great dialogues of Plato. And, right, there's, there, there's this weird ambivalent thing going on uh, with Plato. But I think if you step aside what he says about Plato and pay attention to how he is saying things about reality, quality, and goodness, he actually sounds much more like Plato. So I tend to distinguish between what he says about Plato and how he frequently says things in a very platonic fashion, or especially neoplatonic fashion. Well, and he re they reach very similar conclusions. I mean, uh, yes. You know, yeah. transjectivity is rife in that book. And that it seems to yeah. be yeah. what, I mean, at least what Plato is pointing to in this, this passage with that. Yes. That mediating yeah. or transcendent or, or, or transjective yes. third, you know, that's yes. the whole, yeah. that's the punchline to, to Lila, frankly. Um, okay. That, that's interesting though. Cause so he's basically, and he does have that super ambivalent relationship with Plato, but he's largely interpreting, or he's largely, I guess, accepting the interpretation, the traditional interpretation of Plato from the academy, which like you said, when you were in school, there was yes. no discussion of the structure of the republics. It was yes, trying to yes. isolate it to propositional arguments and yes. uh, exclude all the dramatic elements. You had two different, you had these two um, misapprehensions of Plato um, one was the analytic tradition doing exactly what I said, and then you have the continental tradition, uh, especially post Heidegger, uh, later in which Plato often, uh, sort of post phenomenology, Plato often becomes the villain, right, in, 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 in the, the postmodern story um, for, for various reasons that are also, I think, at times not a proper reading of Plato. I think Derrida's reading of Plato um, misses all of the non-propositional that is so central to Plato. Um, and, then, and, and in that sense, I think he's missing something uh, important about Plato in his reading. What's happening now with the third wave uh, is, is trying to get beyond those two and get back to, well, all the stuff we're talking about right now, and D.C. Schindler is, I think, you know, um, I, I, I think he's a, a, a paragon of an exemplary case of this third wave of scholarly appreciation and understanding of Plato. Well said. Um, okay, so I'm jumping to page 90, 91 now, and this is a very long excerpt, so I won't read the whole thing, but this is essentially where 
And again, here's another name. I don't know if I can pronounce Glaucon. Glaucon is right. Yeah. Glaucon. Glaucon yeah. challenges Socrates basically to show that it is preferable to be truly just yes. while appearing unjust. Yes. Rather than being truly unjust and appearing just. Yes. And this is like quite the brilliant little yeah. attack on Socrates <laughs> or challenge Socrates rather. And I'll read just one small part of this excerpt. Um, you know, if you want me to expand, just let me know. But yeah, um, this is in regard to Glaucon. It says he strengthens this suggestion by relating as a kind of thought experiment to the story of the ring found by Gyges, Gyges's ancestor. Yeah. A ring that renders its wearer invisible. Anyone possessing this ring, he proposes, would obviously act unjustly, which is another way of saying that since justice is merely the relative good that everyone takes it to be, it follows that if we eliminate appearances by becoming invisible, there will be no justice. This outcome serves in effect to link relativism espoused by Thrasymachus and Protagoras with the right. twofold nature of goodness to say that justice is desirable only for its benefits is to say that its entire reality consists of in seeming that it has no quote unquote in itself essence or nature of its own, but is wholly relativized and therefore subject to manipulation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. I don't, maybe you could talk us through some of that, the challenge that Glaucon makes to Socrates. And yes. I, I don't know if at the timing, I mean, I guess we could talk about his response to how he sort of diffuses it. Um, or, or maybe we should wait. I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, we'll, we'll follow the logos where it goes. Um, um, so the Glaucon is trying to set up this beautiful thought experiment um, in a way of, really steel manning or steel personing Thrasymachus's argument uh, because the previous arguments had not really separated the appearance and the appearance means it's, 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 it's instrumental good, how it's good to me, relative to me, relevantly to me, right? Uh, from how justice is good in of itself. We could, we could use our, that heuristic I proposed. Would we want there to be justice even if we were not around, uh, right, that kind of thing? Um, I'm not saying that's a definition, by the way. I'm just saying that's a useful way of trying to separate things in your mind. And what the thought experiment proposes is that if we could manage appearances, we would no longer care about the reality. Because the point about the ring is, Whenever I wanted to do something unjust, there would no, be no appearance of that. And then when I take the ring off, I could, I, I, I could be disingenuous and I could pretend. And so, right, there'd be the appearance of justice, well, whereas the reality of my actions would be unjust. And then what, what DC Schindler is saying on behalf of Glaucon, I don't think Glaucon quite sees this, but Plato does, right? Um, that would be to say that justice doesn't really exist. It would be to say that to use some, you know, psychoanalytic language, justice would just be a projection. It would just be a projection. It would be a projection in which we, right, make this projection only because our real agenda is to manipulate uh, things for our own benefit. And if we weren't, if people weren't like, aware uh, of our injustice, we would be, we would always act in an unjust manner. First of all, did that help make clear what's going on there? Yes, and yes. It, 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 so the idea is the thought experiment is an attempt to show that the intrinsic goodness reduces completely to instrumental goodness. And then instrument, and this is going to be part of a larger argument. So I'm only making this move now, but there's going to be an argument to justify it. If something is only an instrumental good, it doesn't have any real existence. We can use a distinction from John Searle here to help us. We can talk about the difference between something that has an intrinsic existence and something that has an attributed existence, right? So I'll take it for, at least for granted that 
this is relatively uncontroversial. You know, gravity intrinsically exists. You know, we could we could all try to pretend that it doesn't exist, or right, uh, right. Whereas I take it, and maybe maybe I don't know, maybe uh, maybe uh, I'll see you. One of the standard examples of something that only exists in an attributed fashion is money, which is if we all agree it doesn't exist, it stops existing. It's based on an ongoing social contract, um, and that's why money from the American Confederacy is not money. There are pieces of paper that intrinsically exist. But they're not money anymore, and so right, and 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 so what we can ask is, right, it, it, you're already starting to see the connection between these kinds of goodness and attributed or a merely relative existence and something intrinsically existing. So if we say that justice is only instrumentally right good, we are saying it rich, virtually does not, it, not virtually, it it really does not intrinsically exist and therefore it is just its existence is completely subject to our manipulation right and therefore there is no way in which it can make a demand on us does that help yeah so uh money being the um emergent property of a consensus of some kind, or is gravity yes. presumably is independent of that consensus? Yes, yes. And, and like you have pointed out, part of your criticism of fiat currency is the fact that it is subject to a manipulation that has nothing to do with, you know, the good that we are trying to realize through currency, if I've understood your argument correctly. Absolutely. Yeah. You move from, yeah, natural money like gold that was just the free action of people choosing an instrument that works yeah. versus people using force, deception, violence yeah. to push yeah. this other mechanism onto people, right. basically. Yeah. So that's a good analogy then for yeah. us. So this is, and then what Socrates is going to try to show it, it is that. The, a, a person that is living that way is actually not the most free person, not the most realized person in both senses of the word, but actually the person who is most imprisoned, most in the cave, to use a later uh, analogy. But that's only the second move, and people sometimes stop there, and they shouldn't, because right, it's justice is not only right something that intrinsically is exists and is intrinsically good, but it is also good for you, right? Um, and, and so he, Socrates is trying to build an argument uh, to show how if you don't, if you lose, if you lose justice as intrinsically existing, you lose how it is good for you. And when you lose that, you lose your freedom, you lose your humanity, etc. Yeah, I think this uh, something we'll get into later, but it, you're saying if you try to instrumentalize justice, perhaps you undermine yes. its its uh, absoluteness or its or its in itself goodness, its intrinsic goodness. Yes, and that so, so th destroys yes. the the instrumental goodness. Yes, totally. And this is a tension that's happening right now in the modern. I don't know what to call it, you know, almost a religious fervor around justice, social justice. Uh, first of all, very, there's very little discussion about what justice is, there, right? Uh, um, it, there's usually just intuitions about fairness taken to be equivalent to justice, uh, even though many people question that as the central feature of justice, etc. So there's that problem. But there's the problem of there, you have this epistemology and ontology of social constructivism things are socially constructed, right? But then you confront the very problem that Glaucon is giving, uh, you know, provoking a discussion in us about, because, right, well, does justice intrinsically exist? Or is it only exist in relationship to us? But if only exists in relationship to us, why should it place any demand on me at all and in fact, all it is is a crypto way of you placing some demand on me. And so the, the position tends to right, very quickly you know, come onto a precipice 
of being self-undermining in a powerful way because it wants to treat justice as an absolute reality, but tries to say that there are no such things as absolute realities. This is a deep contradiction in the ontology uh, of our current discussion around justice. Yeah, it's, it's a great point. I guess also maps back on to relative versus absolute, right? And that, that social much. consensus of money is obviously relative, it's relational, but yeah. something like gravity is absolute, yeah. right? It's unchanging. There's not much we can do about it. Um, and it, another thing that's coming up for me here, just to mention it, but I think I heard this from you or is inspired by you, that like the variance inside of a system will coalesce to the invariance in a way. So gravity is an example, right? Every organism, every organization, every structure on earth is adapted to gravity, earth's gravity specifically. Yes. But, um, and if you dialed up gravity or dialed it down by any significant measure, you would destroy, you know, all, your, your heart would stop, your car would get crushed, <laughs> you know, like everything would fall apart basically. So all the variation of those survival strategies have adapted to the invariance of gravity itself. Right, and notice how you just did the procession on the return. Mm. There's gravity, and then there, it, right, it, it, it is specified in all of these different structural functional organizations in risk that operate within it, that they part, because everything participates, well, everything on earth participates in earth's gravity, right? That we, right, it, it's, it, it is both universal, but also specified in the way things are, as you said, adapted to gravity. Yeah, just some, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, the universal force of attraction, is it gravity or is it love? <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I, I think Einstein has a joke about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, all right, speaking of love, I'm going to page 94 here. And this, this is where I think there's real, real power in this chapter is this connection of, as we talked offline, between reason, intelligibility, love, knowledge, yes. like it's yes. very, yes. very ill understood yet important point, I think here. So Schindler writes, as a means of introducing the nature of philosophy, Plato quite surprisingly and significantly begins by discussing the nature of love or desire. Yes, love is not love, he says, unless it wants the whole of what it loves. Yes, W H O L E, and yes. is not content with a mere part a philosopher yes. is one therefore who desires the whole of wisdom and possesses in this respect an insatiable love of learning mm -hmm. and there's a footnote here that says that in which socrates is referring to another book in which socrates insists that a genuinely philosophical nature must be free meaning that it strives after the whole of all that is divine and human. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as someone that just, I, go ahead. Must, just, just to make sure, it must be free in love. So it's not free in some absolute sense, right? But free in love. Um, I think uh, what it says here is that Socrates is insisting that a genuinely philosophical nature must be free, meaning that it strives after the whole of all that is divine and human. Right. And that's driving after the whole is love. Yes, exactly. But I think what, well, as I read that, he's, and this is something I want to ask you about because freedom is yeah. something, I don't know why I was born this way, but it's a, it's a very deeply held value for me personally. I've always, sure. I, I call myself a freedom maximalist. I don't know. Feels, feels right on a lot of levels. <laughs> what is the relationship here between the necessity of being free and being able to engage in love and I guess, therefore, discover truth or knowledge or use reason. I mean, I, I'm throwing a lot at you here, but <laughs> take it whichever no, direction no. you want. So, well, let, let me ask you a question first, because I, I don't want to proceed without presuming. Do you think of freedom as an instrumental or an intrinsic good? I would say that it's both. Um, ah, I can't imagine. 
yeah, yeah. I, I can't imagine a world where you can derive instrumental you can't even discover what's instrumentally good for you without freedom you know you need you, it's also well let's just keep it simple keep it simple in the way you said it yes i want freedom to be here when i'm gone <laughs> you know if, if anything yeah, yeah, i'd yeah. like my life to contribute to the greater proliferation of freedom after i'm gone so excellent excellent answer um so then let me let me let me further try to re re refine my question i need these answers from you before i can answer you um so people frequently make a distinction between freedom from and freedom to, where freedom is a being released from imposition, deception, violence, any kind of compulsion. But freedom to is right the capacity to, uh, to well, basically uh, this is going to be Plato's answer, but it's to enter into relationships that you then bind yourself to. So a, a free person is not somebody who. It, um, well, at least Plato would argue. I'm, I, I'm asking you a question. Like freedom to means freedom to love what is true, good, and beautiful. Uh, that's what freedom to means. And so a person is only freedom is only thinking about freedom from. It has not well has not grasped the whole of freedom. And for me, that's what I was trying to emphasize in my remark to you that. What Socrates, Socrates obviously wants freedom from, because he was compelled, there was the, you know, the tyranny of the oligarchy, the tyranny of the democracy that eventually kills him. That's obviously the case, but it's also freedom to, you see, let me say something that might sound paradoxical to, to you. Um, um, and, one, and one criticism, by the way, I think the no, modern notion of, Ameri of American freedom has largely degenerated into just freedom from, and there's very little discussion of freedom to. So I think the culmination of my freedom is to have my thoughts completely determined by what is true, my perceptions by what is beautiful, and my actions by what is good. And for me, that complete determination by those things that I deeply love is actually the greatest freedom, even though it's paradoxically to be completely determined. Now, does that strike you as a reasonable thing to say? Or does the paradox strike you as a contradiction? No, it, it I think the way you phrased it sounds contradictory, and I'm pivoting on that word determined by, but I would yes. say that it seems to me like it's more like a co determination, right, that there is some element of volition or choice. Like, yes, yes, we get to choose. And you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, so to speak. I know there's a, an objective quality to it and a subjective, but it seems like more of a transjective phenomenon. I think that's that's a very good answer. Uh, and then what I want to do is is play with Frankfurt's notion, Reasons for Love, where he says that love is a voluntary necessity. We There seems to be both a choice, but the choice immediately binds us to a commitment that we are responsible to and that we are called to fulfill right um, and, and so that's how i'm trying i'm trying to use this that's that sense of determination not the sense of compulsion or, co or co coercion right the way that right. i can determine what the meaning of this text is exactly that sense of determination is, is, and, is and that ordering to i think is what schindler would say right and yes. ordering to yes. truth or beauty or goodness yes no. yes exactly exactly yeah. exactly and yeah. so for me, that's the answer to your question. So in, answer, in getting you to answer my question, I think you, you have answered the question. That is the deep connection between freedom, love, and the good. Again, where the good is the ontological good, that which it's behind, the through line of the true, the, uh, the, 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 the ethical good and the beautiful. That's, so we, we, we together worked out the answer to, to your question. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. And, um, you know, it's somewhat obvious, perhaps, if you think that, you know, you can't coerce love or truth, no. you know, it's no. all, there's this element, this unavoidable element of volition or choice that you, it, otherwise but, you just can't exist. <laughs> but it's not arbitrary preference. Right. See that? Right. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Agreed. Yes. Right. Yeah. So 
it, 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 love puts us into the same space of reason. It is between the arbitrary and the algorithmic. It is, it is not arbitrary preference, and it is not something that is compelled on us by some sort of law, right, or, or force, but it is, it, is, it, it is in that domain in between. But nevertheless, we, are, we, we have ratio religio to it, right? Yes, yes. This, I'm reminded here of meaning, too, where, you know, yes. where is the meaning in the book? Well, it's between all the words and the pages and the sentences, but it's also between the reader and the book, right? That's right. That's right. You're, you're receiving the message. You're filtering it through your own prior experiences and yes, memories and all yeah. of this. So we're back to this transjective fittedness, I guess. Yeah. Again, again. And, and, and then, and then within that, there's, there's an optimality, an optimal grip to use Marlo Ponti that best, right. Uh, best, like I said, it, it, it is best simultaneously true to us and true to uh the, the 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 world or the reality the the instrumental yeah. good or, and the intrinsic good it's true right. to the instrumental right. good and the intrinsic good in yeah a and, optimal way in an optimal way and so man so funny i've heard you describe this as oh man i forget which athletic position you were describing it as but i i analogize this to the power position in sport where if you've ever watched american oh. football like a middle yeah. linebacker he'll sit in the power position, which is like a slightly, yeah. slightly bent legs, kind of bent over a little bit Yeah, yeah. He's in that position where he can move. He has the most dynamic options, yeah. right? He yes. can move yes. many directions as easily as he wants. And so that's kind of like an optimal grip, I guess, with the game, right? No matter what right. happens in the game, he has yeah, yeah. maximal optionality. And that was funny enough. That was the through line I just written down. You were talking about freedom from and freedom to. The through line between those, I think, is options, right? You yes. can have the option to be freedom, to be free from something, or the option to do something. And a yes. lot of what a lot of what we do in economic reality is expand options. Basically, there's a lot of people with a lot of wants, and we create new ways to satisfy the wants, and we create more options. So now, you and I can do this thing over Zoom, whereas 100 years right. ago that wasn't an option, right? Um, no, I. That's very good. I hadn't thought about. I hadn't thought about wealth as the open uh, opening up of optionality space. Mm -hmm. That's very good. That's very good. Um, I, I, I just uh, the what I use is I use the the, the fighting stance in Tai Chi Chuan. You yes. don't actually use the fighting stance for anything. It's the sort of optimal nexus place that yes. gets you gives you the best overall you know minimal path uh, length to any any place you need to be. So right. I actually call that meta optimal gripping. Each actual fight fighting move is the optimal grip but the stance is the meta optimal grip it's the optimal grip on all the optimal gripping yes 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 perfect and the other analogy that just exploded into my mind as we were talking about that is the concept in, in astronomy called the berry center so it's very actually i heard this on peterson's podcast the other day he had um oh who is the very the super famous atheist richard dawkins richard dawkins yes and, and richard dawkins made the point he goes it's an objective fact that the earth goes around the sun. And Peterson didn't reply to this, but I was like, oh shit, he should have caught him right there because that's not true. They yeah. actually, the earth and the sun revolve around their mutual center of gravity, which is yes, the very yes. center. Yes, yes. So, you know, yes. like w when Jupiter goes around the sun, it has a slight wobble because Jupiter is so massive. But every yes. object that has mass has gravity, is in a gravitational dance. Yes with every other yes. gravitational object, the earth does not revolve around the sun. The earth revolves in the, around the same thing the sun revolves around, which is the very center yes. between the earth and the sun. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yes, that's well said. That's, that's a good analogy too. <laughs> it's interesting. Like, I, Yeah, this fitness thing is so irreducible, I guess. Um, okay, I think that was a good intro to love for sure. Now I'd like to tell you about a great new Bitcoin show on the scene that you've got to check out. Brought to you by Swan Studios and Bitcoin Magazine, this show is Hard Money with Natalie Brunel. Natalie is an Emmy-nominated journalist bringing unparalleled experience to the Bitcoin media scene. And personally, Natalie is one of my favorite voices in the Bitcoin space. Each week on Hard Money, you'll get the top headlines of the week with analysis you won't find anywhere else. 
hard-hitting interviews with amazing guests like myself and other top minds in the Bitcoin space. And the show will take you directly into the lives being changed by Bitcoin all over the world. Check out Hard Money at swan.com backslash hard money. Today, I want to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. So how does health insurance work? You send an egregious amount of money to an insurance company. They hold it in a pool of depreciating fiat currency. Then when you have a large health event, you have to pay them even more via your deductible. And then you hope they will cover your bill. And in fact, one in six bills are denied by healthcare.gov plans. It's time to take control of your own healthcare bills. I'd like to introduce you to CrowdHealth. It's a decentralization of healthcare using Bitcoin as an alternative to health insurance. Instead of sending fiat currency to a big corporation, you send that money to an account controlled by you, a portion of which is converted into Bitcoin. Then if you have a big health event, you have a community of Bitcoiners that will use the money in their accounts to help you out. To get more details, go to joincrowdhealth.com backslash breedlove, where you can find the promo code for $99 a month for six months. I think um, another point Plato is making here is that being an appearance are not two different things. They're no. two different aspects of one thing. Um, just a by brief by way of brief excerpt, Schindler writes, the sensible appearance, Plato goes on to say, is not the thing itself, but a likeness of it. Yes. But a likeness cannot be the whole thing. It is instead literally an aspect, which is ad spacer, I think is the yeah. Latin terminology, maybe, uh, or relative part. So there's a, a an absolute and a relative dimension to a thing which we call being versus appearance. Yes. Um, and this Schindler saying too in a footnote that that argument, his argument in the book, uh, agrees with Fine's critique of a two worlds thesis, but proposes that the powers are distinguished not by different objects but by different presentational modes, one might say, of the same object. Yes. Which is really interesting. And then it goes on to say, there's also, uh, according to H. Jackson, who wrote on Plato's Republic 6, image and reality are not two distinct existences, but one existence viewed either directly or indirectly. Yes. And... Um, Again, I'm just like tying this back to money and economics, how money is like expanding our perception by giving right. us an indirect view of the world. Right. Yeah. Is really interesting to me. So it's, it's almost like an indirect view of goods, let's say, through pricing. Yes. Provides a more quantitatively relevant set of information but at the expense of qualitative information, like you don't, you, know, you can know the price of corn or whatever it is without seeing the corn yeah. itself, right? Yes. But the other approach, which would be direct observation of the corn, you get a, a much higher qualitative uh, okay. view on the good, yep. but you're giving up the quantitative, which is, you know, everyone else's relative viewpoints on corn as expressed in its price. So I don't, right. I'm, I'm just trying to tease out there's some like there's a trade off relationship here between direct and indirect observation that seems to be occurring in a being an appearance, maybe. Uh, OK, well, let me let me let's return to. Let's return to uh, a way and I want to really come back to this in depth. I was talking about it last time, which is and let's use the term aspect. And remember, I was holding up the flashlight. Now I'm holding up this book and I'm moving it around and I'm getting all of these aspects. And first there's all the perceptual aspects and then there's all the all the conceptual aspects, all the imaginal aspects. And we have this multi aspectuality. And then there was the idea that you realize, oh, I can never actually see or even conceive of the, the whole book. 
But what I can do is I can get the sense of the through line, the through line, which is not any aspect, but nevertheless binds all of the aspects together so they don't strike me as, you know, um, a, a discontinuous carcophony. Do you, do you remember, remember that? Yes, yes. And so um, what Fine is criticizing, I, I believe, is what became, and, and Plotinus is to some degree responsible for this, even though I don't think he was actually advocating, but the two worlds mythology of the Axial Revolution, right, gets interwoven with the Platonic. And you have two existences, two worlds, two sets of objects, right? And then that gets mapped onto earth and heaven, except, and you get the whole supernatural, natural distinction that I talk about awakening from the meaning crisis and how this two worlds mythology is in some sense, and we use it, but, but I, want, I, want, I want you to think of a, a, of a realization you had. When you realized that the two worlds notion of transcendence was actually not the best notion of transcendence, Right, and you realize, oh no, no, the two worlds. It was perhaps a, a metaphor, but I want to leave the metaphor behind and get to something deeper. And this is what Fine is doing the same thing. And, and I was trying to suggest to you that the form, the being of the thing, is, is that through line, and that right. It's it, but it's not separable from the appearances. It's not like you can take the through line out of the appearances. It's, right. Here's the through line, right, right. And, but but right, but neither is the through line any kind of aspect, or even when we move out, even any kind of perspective. So all these aspects and perspectives, these are the relational, right? These are the relative to me, relative to you. Right? These are right. That's that's the relative. But the through line, which is not any aspect or any perspective, but binds them together as the absolute. But you can't, you can't, you shouldn't separate them through right. two worlds. It's like saying, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, there's all the notes. And, and then in between them, there's the melody. And I'm going to separate the melody from all the notes, <laughs> right? right? right. Uh, or, or it's like, what? What does that mean? That, now, the melody isn't a note, right? To use right. an analogy. Right. And, and no note is the melody, but, you, right? And, 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 and it's not just, the gestalt uh, of collecting the notes, if we mean that just as a spatial unity, it's this intelligibility, this non-logical identity between all the aspects and all the perspectives. Did that, did that, did that yes, help? Yeah, yes, it does a lot. So almost a, we get a richer or higher resolution um, conceptualization of these different aspects Yes. Right, the, the more aspects that we consider and, I, and yes. maybe and you, you use the word identity I, I guess we're assigning the identity ultimately based on the properties of that thing right that's what the bird it can right. fly and it squeaks and it you know has feathers has these different properties to it but something um, binds them together which is not itself right a property right yeah, so, so the challenge here is we're almost trying to talk about this through line, but it's not a perspective, not an aspect, not a concept even. It's just the, yeah, the absolute yeah, and, integrity of reality, something like that. Yeah, exactly. And that's what he's going to get onto when he talks about the in itself. But what he, what he really, why he does this first is he wants to break us away from the longstanding tradition of understanding this as the, in terms of the two worlds mythology. This is what I, Robert, this is what I've been on about in, in so many ways about trying to get what, you know, the, 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 the non-axial, right, to, to get Plato out of the two worlds mythology so that he is viable for the meaning crisis because the meaning crisis is we are, we've lost the two worlds as a viable ontology and yet all of our ways of understanding the wisdom traditions like Plato are still bound to this two worlds mythology that is preventing us from reaccessing the wisdom. And Schindler is right, he's precisely trying to do that project. That's why I find his work so influential on mine. The two worlds, this is, I mean, this is a, another expression of relativism, right? Where you're you're just stuck between these two worlds rather than seeing the the continuity between them. Well, the continuity or, or that reality is that which binds 
right? The invariant and the variant, the absolute and the relative together, right? And, 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 and this, is where, this is where Nietzsche's critique of the two worlds comes in. You, you, and let's use some of our language before, right? You know, the, this world is only instrumentally valuable to getting to heaven where all, all the real, where all the reality really is, right? And therefore, but then Nietzsche said, but if that happens and you lose the belief or, or, or the trust that there is this upper world, then all you're left with is a world that you have been enculturated to view as having no value. To use our language, you wouldn't want it to exist anymore if you didn't exist. There's no desire for that. And what I am trying to do, right, which is both getting beyond Nietzsche's critique and returning back to, to Plato, is I'm trying to help people fall in love with being again. And the two worlds mythology which was incredibly instrumentally valuable for helping people make sense of this stuff and, and map between religion, Christianity all right, right, and Platonism. I, I, there's a reason why it was adopted in the Axial Revolution. I, 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 I get that, but, and this is where people will disagree with me, uh, you know, but it, it's time is over. It's time is over and we need to, move to a way of, well, affording this profound love, this, this deep transcendence that you realized that is not beholding to the two worlds mythology, because then we can integrate all of this into potentially a scientific worldview. Is this um, another manifestation of us being trapped in this sort of subject object duality worldview or metaphysics and that, uh, well I, because even I, I, the, ex the example you gave earlier where if if it's heaven and earth right even yeah. if you believe heaven is the ultimate like it still justifies any action on earth in a way people will just do whatever in the name of this heaven that you can't access so i'm yeah. reminded here of chapter one where the relativism grounds out and justifying violence oh, and that's nietzsche's critique right it 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 it, it, it it causes you to actually reject the opening passages of Genesis in which God created the world and saw that it was good, right? It, it may be fallen, but, it, you know, and if God pronounces it as good, well, I mean, maybe it's good for God, but that's pretty much the same as being good in and of itself, right? It, it, right. <laughs> there's a long argument in there. I'm just skipping over. But the <laughs> point, right, it, it, and this is one of the deep criticisms that Christianity made against Gnosticism. Because Gnost at least some versions of Gnosticism absolutized right the distinction. I, I, I guess what what's really sort of crucial here is this this notion of replacing transcendence, although it's bound into the word, and so we're 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 we're, we're messing with the etymology, but replacing transcendence above with transcendence into. Mm. The way we talked about last time, the way you transcend yourself through your beloved. You don't think you're transcending above yourself. You act, it's through that. And this is why for Plato, there's a deep, deep belonging together of any sense of transcending through the levels of reality and the way we transcend through each other between the vertical and the horizontal kinds of transcendence. They, dia, dialectic is about keeping them completely bound together. And what happened is we, 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 they, they became unglued and we, we, we got this notion of, yeah, we got this notion of leaving the earth in some fashion as being the hallmark of transcendence. I want it to be get back to what, you know, I think Schindler's arguing for, we see in Plato, which is no, no, we, what we really need right now is we really need to love the earth. We really, really do. Wow. No, that's excellently said. And you see that in the aspirations of people like Elon Musk, right? Trying to get us off the earth rather than yes, yes. Love, love what's here. 
yes, there, there's lots of jokes to be made at his expense about his <laughs> rocket, but I won't go into those right now. Uh, <laughs> All right, I'll read another excerpt here, moving us along. I'm on page 97. Uh, Schindler writes, we ought to recognize here the point made in a negative manner in the, I don't know if I can pronounce this book, Theatius, Theatitus. 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 Yeah. Right. If something does not exist beyond mere relativity to another, the verb to be no longer has any meaning. Being yes. thus, in some sense, corresponds to things in distinction from their relation, while appearance corresponds to things relative to others. So yes. again, we're back into there's the absolute nature of being versus the relative nature of appearance. Um, let's see. He goes on to write, <clears throat> in contrast to the in itselfness that being represents, According to this account, Plato claims that relatedness always entails change and ambiguity. Yes. It is not difficult to understand why. There is no limit to the number of things something can be relative to. Yes. And each of these things is different from the others. Yes. It follows that what something is in relation to others as relative will be in some respect different in each case. Yes. And then he concludes this paragraph saying appearance lies between reality and unreality. Yes. Um, so there's this, I don't, I'm just on a limb here, but it seems to be like perhaps ambiguity is inversely related to differentiation as in the more ambiguous something is, the less differentiated it is, right? The extreme case of just pure entropy, I guess. It's totally ambiguous and totally undifferentiated. But as something becomes more specific, it's clearly more differentiated. That's what it means. I, I don't know if I'm saying, sometimes I say these things and I'm not sure if I'm saying nothing or everything. But uh, Well, let's, let, let, let's play with it because, um, so ambiguity is usually understood as multiple aspects, multiple interpretation with no way to choose um, between them as to what is relevant or appropriate, right? So, um, you know, the, the word take is ambiguous. Um, when I take a possession, it's very different than taking a bath or taking a crap. Right, They're very, very different, right? Um, and so, oh, right. And so, there's multiple. There's so in that sense, the me there's there's a differentiation, and there's multiple interpretations or meanings available to you. But to your point, there's a sense in which they're all right. It, ambiguity is when there's con they're conflated together in the sense that you cannot choose or even adequately distinguish between these different possible meanings. Does, does, does yeah, that, you're does, lacking context, perhaps. You're, uh, well, you're 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 lacking you're lacking how, right? Um, you're lacking how that, that word is relevant to your situation and the task at hand, right? How it's relevant to your thought, how it's relevant to your tasks, how it's relevant to your goals, etc. That's what's happening in, in ambiguity. So, for example. Um, you know, you, you know, if I say to you, taking is good, and, and you, you say, well, I don't know what that means, because <laughs> there's all these different meanings of take, right? Yeah. Uh, right. So uh, try to get, give an example. And so the way the, 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 the try to, again, try to come back to the, 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 the through line and the, and the melody and the note, right? And, and right. And, and, but like, as I said, the multi aspectuality opens up inexhaustibly, right? And, and then the Platonic claim is not that there is a, a, like a common set of properties for all of those, because that's to try and make one aspect the measure of all the other aspects. But like I said, there's this through line 
that is not any particular aspect or any, or any per particular perspective that explains how you can move from one to the other and adequately distinguish one from the other. Because if you couldn't move from one to the other and yet see them in relationship to each other, mm -hmm. you couldn't disambiguate them. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that making sense? Yes. This, yes. Is gonna go to, this is going to go to the point of the relative without the absolute, the aspects without the through line actually loses all intelligibility Right, like, right. like again, if I took if I took out the melody from the notes, I just get the cacophony, and then the, it 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 precisely becomes something that no human being would desire because it makes no sense, can have no meaning, and right. therefore, you know, there's there's nothing that it, there's no way it can matter to you. Yes, go ahead. I was just saying it's incoherent. Yeah, radically so. Radically so. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Um really interesting that, that so hmm. the, so here, here, here like like of all of these different instances of something so you've got you've got aspects and perspective and even different different you know different instances of something like you know justice or something like plato is saying if they were if they were all actually completely incommensurate with each other there is, you would have a kind of carcophonous, perpetual, chaotic ambiguity, which would mean that would literally be unthinkable to you. Yeah, that, that makes sense. That, back to goodness as the um, cause of intelligibility. Yes, Something, yes. Yeah, right. Yes. Yeah, we were talking about Hitler yesterday, right? <laughs> Yeah, there had to be something in there that made him function as an organism. Otherwise, he yeah. wouldn't exist. Yeah. Yeah, and and, and 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 there had to be some through line, however deviant and twisted, that that was within all the cacophony. Because I think there was cacophony in his mm -hmm. mind, but there had to be enough that he was able to, you know, bind people to him, bind them to a mission, mm -hmm. uh, etc. Again, one more time. I am not justifying right. or excusing his evil. I'm making the different claim that evil is ultimately parasitic on the good. So would the good then be closely aligned to your concept of relevance realization? Because isn't that well, parasitic uh, processing no, no, on? Yeah. yeah, I so for me. <laughs> that is like that is that is the question that you could wake up John Ravaki at 3 a.m. Right. <laughs> uh, um, so um, it is it is it is perfectly appropriate and even wonderful that you ask it. Um, I think, like I've tried to say, nothing is intrinsically relevant, right? And relevance is this transjective thing. But nevertheless, and I, I directly use the model. Just like the adaptivity of the organism, there's no there's no essence, you know. There's no set of properties of the turtle or the finch or the bacterium or the, the you know the oak tree that that they all share that explains their adaptivity. That's to try and reduce right adaptivity to a particular aspect of it, right. a particular way in which it is relative to a, a particular environment. Right. And so relevance is like that. Relevance is your mind sort of creating a particular morphology of fittedness to this environment. But behind all of the adaptations is a universal principle of evolution, which actually causes adaptivity to exist and makes it intelligible. Behind all of the instances of relevance, there is a cognitively universal process of relevance realization that helps to explain the nature of what we're doing when we're finding things relevant. So for me, and, and this is not Schindler, okay? But I don't think it's inconsistent with Schindler. I think the, the way relevance realization fits us to the environment and fits the environment to us by aspectualizing the environment I, I, I treat this as a phone. I tap into one aspect of it. I've aspectualized it and made salient some of its features rather than others. I think, right, relevance realization 
and the way it's transjective, it fits into Schindler's more comprehensive model of the way being and appearance are related to each other. So relevance realization is kind, relevance realization is transjective, but it, right, it's, it's a particular species within cognitive conscious beings of how the absolute and the relative are bound together. Did that help or was that just worse? <laughs> no, it's, it's, I love hearing you talk about it because, <clears throat> well, maybe this would be helpful for me by way of disambiguation. Um, a lot when I hear you talk about relevance, I often hear it closely echoing the economist talking about value again and that's why i yes. think i was asking about value earlier uh, yes so yes. let me let me ask you a general question and then i'll say a couple of things that will hopefully indicate what i'm trying to get yes. to you i want to ask you the difference between relevance and value yes so for in an economic sense the common example i like to give is there's the material realm where this is just a table, right? This table that's holding yeah. my computer. Well, to me, this table is valuable or relevant in the sense that it's an accessory to me. It's helping me hold my computer and do this podcast. Yes, yes. If yes. I gave someone $100 to run and jump over the table, the table would be kind of like an obstacle to their goal, right? Yes. Of, of, yeah. So it yes. could be... It can be relevant to many different people in many different ways based yes, on yes, the yes. course of their goal-directed action, let's say. Um, so that's one where I'm not sure, I'm not sure how you disentangle relevance and value there. And the one other thing I'd like to say is, because you said humans are intrinsically valuable, or at least that's a supposition of kind of Western civilization or yes. maybe whoever, yeah. wherever it came from. But you yeah. also said nothing is intrinsically relevant. So maybe that's yes. the crux of the difference there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that that that's exactly uh, that's a very good point. So first of all, uh, the distinction between relevance and value, I, I, and maybe this is in your notion of value, but it's not in a lot of notions of value that I hear people using. Value is understood as a subjective projection onto things. Relevance is not subjective projection. Relevance, that right, it, 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 it is taking into account some of the truth of the table and some of the truth of you, right? It, it, right? Uh, and, 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 and so it's again, it's fitting you to the facts of the environment and fitting the, and, and finding the facts that fit to you in order for you to help it. So if you mean that by value, I don't see a difference. I would say to you that many people don't mean that by the word value. They think of value as an arbitrary preference that can be projected on anything as they so choose. And if that's what you mean, relevance isn't that way because there is information that is relevant to solving the nine dot pro problem and, and you can miss it by how you misapprehend what is relevant to solving the problem. Did, did, that, did that, first of all? Help? Yeah, that, that does. And that is consistent with economics too. They say value is purely subjective. Um, but it, it, it's a bit still ambiguous. I think relevance may be the better term overall because there are yeah. things that, you know, you can't, okay, we have preferences of the food we like to eat, but there's certain things we just can't eat, right? There's facts of the environment. Yeah, yeah, you can't, yeah. you can't yeah, eat metal, yeah. right? Whatever. Yeah. Maybe you can, I don't know. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, so I guess instead of, it, it's more of value would be more in the camp of purely subjective, whereas relevance is more transjective. Right. So now here's the, here's the, the, what I think is the, 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 the move I make to answer the second problem. Um, and you can tell me whether or not it's a, a, a move or a dodge. I think it's a move, which is, I think when you, I think one of the things that relevance realization is always right bound to is relevance realization, right? Uh, because it's an inherently self-correcting process. So one of the, th if, if you'll allow me to anthropomorphize, one of the things that relevance realization is always interested in is relevance realization. And insofar as you are a relevance realizer, therefore uh, you are intrinsically interesting to me, if I can put it that way. Now, remember, 
we're, we're, we're trying to bridge this out into, remember, it, please, relevance realization is not cold calculation. Right. It is how you fundamentally care, what you pay attention to, what you bind yourself to, right? So you have to hear all of that when I say, you know, you, we are, we, we, if we care about, if I'll, I'll use language that might be a little bit more helpful, although it's not exactly the same. If we care about meaning making, we have to intrinsically care about, sorry, if we care about meaning, we have to intrinsically care about meaning makers, right? Right, because right, right. For that reason. Now, the, the, that means that it's not that human beings are intrinsically relevant um, it, uh, because in one sense, they're not. I, there are times when I will ignore you and it is appropriate to do so. But their capacity for being relevance realizers is something that always should be intrinsically interesting to me. So I'm trying to say that relevance realization is kind of intrinsically relevant, um, but I'm doing it in this kind of uh, this kind of reflective way. Um, there's because there's nobody sort of that it's intrinsically relevant to outside of relevance realizers. Did that help? Yes, no, it does. It does. Um, uh, yeah, I'm just thinking again, uh, it's uh, the dynamic process of relevance realization is always relevant to realizing relevance in anything, something like that, you know, it's exactly, exactly. And that's yeah. part of that's part of what Schindler talks about, uh, about the inherent self relation of something, make, giving it its independent existence, right? Yeah, and that, that lands well for me too, because again, it's back to this irreducibility of the market process, because even that relevance realization, you're in exchange constantly with, when I say the market process, I don't mean specifically humans trading goods and services. I mean this, everything that's moving and changing is constantly trading and shaping everything else, you know? Yes, I, I took it to yeah. mean that you had, onto, you had expanded the ontological scope yeah. of that reference. And, yeah. And, so and, I, yeah. I rattle that off here, but it's, yeah, we talked about it for like 10 hours on another series. So I should. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. I want to try to jump ahead a little bit because there's so much good stuff in this chapter. Um, I'm going to go up to page 108 where he talks about the approaches to the good. Yes. And um, I think I'll start with this excerpt. Schindler writes the approaches to the good tend to fall into certain basic groups. Yes. One of the more common explanations identifies teleology as what yeah. connects intelligibility and goodness. Yeah. We understand a thing when we see what purpose it fulfills or in what way it is useful or desirable, i.e. good. Yes. A and further down the page says a further well-known view proposes that the good grants the ideal attributes, the permanence, yes. stability, universality, and so forth that make a form a form to the forms, which renders them, renders them reliable objects of the mind. Francisco yes. Gonzalez combines the idealizing function of the good, good right. as an object of knowledge, as object of knowledge, sorry, with its being the cause of our knowing, good as yes. way of knowing. Yes. Um, and there's other there's other approaches. There's the the good the good is actually the the one and the mm. oneing of things um, gives them their both their existence and their knowability, and that is uh, an, on, an ontological good. Um, and what Schindler does is he and there's a few more. He takes all of those, and, and, and yeah, I think he actually uses the term at one place. He tries to find the through line through all of them, uh, which is exemplifying the very thing uh, we've been talking about mm -hmm. here. Uh, and, um, and, and he does that with the proposal that you and I have, have been discussing here, which yep. uh, he says that, that is the, that's, the, that's the thing that's running through all of them, th this notion that he's building of the good. Yeah, I'll read a couple more here. It says David Lochterman interprets the unity of the good as the yes, community exactly. of forms, yeah. each harmonizing with the others by performing the work proper 
to it. Yes. Yeah. So maybe that, you know, we keep using the word through line, but the word unity also fits there. And then yeah. community of forms, each yeah. harmonizing yeah. with the other. Is that reminds me of your example of the music, right? It's almost yes. yeah. the, the harmonization yeah. of these eternal forms into uh, manifest being or appearance, I guess. Yeah. Um, and then one other, one last excerpt. When we know something, we are quote unquote right about it which presumably means we have a quote unquote good grasp of it. We also yeah. have Heidegger's famous interpretation of the radiance of the good as that which brings the manifestation of appearance to evidence. Yes. And then there's it's translated in German. So what? Okay. Um, I'm going to skip ahead one more time too, because they, they get in. So they're, there, I guess he's laying out these different ways to approach the nature of the good, or different yes. aspects maybe of the good, perhaps. Yeah. And then he's getting working his way towards goodness as the measure. And this is on, on page 113. Yes. Um, let me make sure. Well, I should probably not skip this, actually. So there's a point that Aristotle makes it relative goodness... Well, Plato and Aristotle make the point. Relative goodness is always derivative of fundamental goodness. So we're back to that yes. kind of relative and absolute. Yes. You can't take out one and leave the other. Uh, and this means when a thing is loved for its own sake, this means a thing worthy of being loved as an end has its own irreducible being. Yes. And then at the end of this, he says, in other words, the intrinsic goodness of a thing is just its quote unquote in itself character. Socrates yes. implies such a sense of goodness in the, the philobus where he writes the difference between the nature of the good and everything else is this. Any creature that was in permanent possession of it entirely and in every way would never be in need of anything else, but would live in perfect self-sufficiency. So the self-sufficiency, um, I think, is another one of those aspects of the good, right? It's, yes. it's a standalone quality. Um, and I, I just want to, on that last point, th there's kind of this paradox of the self. You hear this, people s describe people as self-made, right? A self-made man. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the ironic part of that for me is that there's no one that's self-sufficient in a market economy, no. right? Like we're no. all dependent yeah. on one another so <clears throat> um i guess that's kind of paradoxical in a way that you are you're self-made in the sense that you went out and conducted relevance realization and yeah, yeah accorded yeah. your actions in order with the good or you you provided goodness to people and some good or service yeah. and then you were became wealthy in the process but at no point in that process were you truly independent, right? You're obviously oh, selling yeah. to people, working with people, yeah. etc. Using the same um, language to talk to them and all kinds yes, of Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. So I'll stop there and let you maybe just touch on a couple of those couple of those approaches to the good and then we can move on. Yeah. So I think uh, I mean and and let's uh, sort of caution the readers. Uh, we can't do it. Schindler takes time to go through each one of these arguments of uh, uh, interpretation and, and then make, show how his proposal can th can thread them together um, in, in, a, in a quite plausible and convincing way. Um, uh, and so the, the, the self-sufficiency, and this goes towards um, I think Spinoza is really good on this. Uh, so, if we uh, if we say that love uh, and and knowledge are both pursuing the whole, and that reason is going to be the binding of uh, love to knowledge, right? And which and they're all, right, and we're getting there, right? Then Spinoza actually asks, what is the what is the only thing that is actually the whole? And possesses the self-sufficiency, and then he he gives the famous answer, um, 
God or nature. Now, first of all, I want to I want to point people to uh, the excellent book, the best book on Spinoza. Like just like this is the best book on Plato, uh, Berlin, uh, uh, Claire Carlyle's um, Spinoza's Religion. And I just had a video, uh, Voices with Verveke, uh, with Claire on this book, right? And, and and so when you get that, you get the idea. Oh, right. What I'm actually talking about, what I'm actually loving, if I'm loving self-sufficiency, is I'm not actually loving myself for the very reason you just gave. I am only a mode that participates to some degree in the self-sufficiency of God or nature. And let's remember when Spinoza is saying that, he's not saying that the way we might hear it as our traditional notion of God or our traditional notion of nature. He's asking you to look beyond our traditional notion of God and our traditional notion of nature and to get something beyond the two of them. Very much, I would say, like Plato's The Good or the Neoplatonic One. Right. And so right. as soon as you do that, you realize, oh, what I'm actually loving is not something that I possess. I'm loving a participation in the self-sufficiency, the, the realness of God or nature, the good. And then you realize, oh my gosh, that's exactly what love is. Love is, uh, you know, an apprehension and an appreciation of your participation in something, right? And, and, then, the, and then the two come together like this. That's beautiful. Yeah, so the, the, the through line there and that self-sufficiency is that, oh, you know what I'm reminded of here is uh, Pearl's book, Theophany, again, where he describes Art. God as overflow, I think, right? Where it's yes, 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 so yes. much goodness in this thing, it's just overflowing into all the forms. Yeah. So it's giving, yeah, yes. sort of uh, giving of itself, I guess, so that yes. if you're self-sufficient. Yeah, exactly. Finish that, that thought. Only the, only the truly self-sufficient. You're emulating self God. Yes, so, yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. And, th and, and this is how the Neoplatonists were picking up on the Stoic idea of self-sufficiency as emulating the logos of reality. Uh, and Spinoza's picking up on that too. So there's a, there's a sense in which we can only realize our hearts, like the quest for personal immortality actually undermines the ability for you to realize the eternity, the connectedness to the self-sufficiency of realness that your heart actually longs for. And th this is like, this is one of, you know, this is, a, you know, an argument that Spinoza makes and other people make um, that the, the way we have, and, and Plato is really careful. Plato, we owe to Plato somebody who takes great care in, in seeing, right, distinguishing immortality from eternity. Because what was happening in Greek, in the Greek philosophical revolution, was the discovery that the Greek gods were merely immortal; they were not eternal, and that they're, they're, and that therefore they did not satisfy the ultimate longing. But in the sense we're describing here of this wholesome, self-sufficient, therefore realness, right? The, we were, we we're talking about the eternal dimension of reality, as opposed to something that's just everlasting or immortal. Transcendent of space and time rather than um, right. enduring right. space and time. Right, right. But, tra but transcending, again, not as above space Through, and time. Through, not above. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. And, 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 and Spinoza basically talks about this. He talks about uh, you know, right, sort of space-time, and, and, you know, thought as different aspects, right? Different attributes of nature. But he says nature, God or nature is actually, you know, something that has infinite attributes. And we are, we're only aware of two of them. Uh, so there is an, ex he has a sense of this, uh, 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 you know, almost incomprehensible through line. Wow. It's very fascinating. Um, 
And so <clears throat> I'll continue on to page 113 here. I thought this was very, a very interesting excerpt. <clears throat> Schindler writes, the same notion can be found in another expression Plato uses to characterize real beings, namely that they, quote unquote, remain forever according to themselves and as themselves. Yes. If goodness is a measure or indeed the measure insofar as it is what is most perfect and complete to share in goodness would be to be in a complete way. So being in a complete way, yes, it would thus make sense to characterize the good as Plato does in the Republic specifically as quote unquote, as what quote unquote preserves and benefits in contrast to the bad that corrupts and dissolves. Yes. In the Phaedo goodness is so to speak, the glue that binds things together while badness entails disintegration because it renders a thing an enemy to itself. Yes. And I'm just reminded here again, Pearl's notion in theophany of God is like the glue that holds together hierarchies. Yes. And our Uh, technological manifestation of that in the world is money. Like, I think that that's my deep philosophical intuition about money, that it's all this, it's this relational thing. It's not really subjective. It's not really objective. It seems like it's transjectivity incarnate, yes, maybe yes. something yeah, like yes. that. And um, it all comes back to this unity, this unification function of the good uh, that seems important yes. for both measurement and uh, you know working together. To, to self-sufficiency, right. but not non-self self-sufficiency in a an interdependent way. I guess you might say. Exactly the absolute bound with. The relative. Yes. And so, and so this this is why the Neoplatonists, uh, you know, equate the one with the good because their idea is the being of something, right? It is is how it is one. Right? And we talked about this last time, right? Uh, you know what what makes this a being is somehow that it's one through all of these changes and all of these aspects and all of these perspectives. But it's important to understand this oneing as not homogenization, right? It, right? it is not an eradication of the differences. It is the oneing of the differences. And, and it's also, so it, it's the oneing of the differences is the return, right? And the, different, the differentiating of the one without ever fragmenting out of being is the procession. But when you th- think about what we talked about last time, how evil is ultimately self-destructiveness, you can see how evil is sort of anti-one, if I can yes. coin that really uh-huh. mangled uh-huh. term, <laughs> right? And so, the the what what this is this is to want to know something is to want to know according to this model that which binds it together which is also it's how it is whole without, but that doesn't mean again, that you've grasped the totality because it's always transcendence through the transcendence through never ends. Right. And then that is again, very well, it it overlaps with your relationship to a person. You're, You're not trying to keep them homogeneously the same when you love them. Think of you did that to your kids. That's a, well, that's 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 horror as a parent. Mm-hmm. You are trying to afford them a through line in their differentiation so they can make sense of themselves to themselves. And 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 to love that is to bind yourself, religio, in an appropriate, proper proportional manner, ratio to that. And then Schindler says, well, that's love. But that's exactly what it is when you want to know something and knowing it well is what reason is about. And so reason and love and knowledge become inseparable from each other. And think about how our culture has them disconnected from each other in a radical, radical way. Yeah, it's it's, it's really interesting. I, I like this uh, connection between goodness and unity. 
um, I'm reminded of, well, first of all, just to reiterate what he said, the good is that which preserves and benefits rather than corrupts and dissolves. Yes. And so when I look out onto the world today, I see all these nation states bound together, right, in the unity of their, their monetary system. But the whole is very fragmented, right? Where, where there's a lot of conflict and, you know, animosity and all of that. So there's, we haven't found something more fundamental, I guess, to, to really unify us. And I'm, there's a quote by Ayn Rand I'll read to you. She says, whenever destroyers appear among men, they start by destroying money for money is men's protection and the base of a moral existence. Mm. So this, the, another way that I've said this before is, you know, the integrity of civilization or the integrity of any of these little nation states, it's absolutely bound to the integrity of their money. If a country, you know, hyperinflates their currency, then what happens while well, they, they adopt someone else's money or they get taken over or whatever. So yes. there's this, uh, I, I think, a, a connection here between goodness, unity being kind of absolute, right? Almost to the point where we're calling it, you know, in Pearl's language, God in a way, right? Whatever binds that hierarchy together. Yes. And the the importance of, of money, and again, just Bitcoin here is like, it's the first money we've ever had that has an absolutely fixed supply. So there's another connection there between the absolute. It's like, yes. we've never made something that exhibits any absolute property at all. Yeah. But it could be, I don't, you know, the visualization I have is like, we're getting one layer deeper, one layer closer to the good, maybe in this, this money that can bind global civilization together in some absolute way. So maybe it's almost like a, um, a money that's closer to the platonic form of goodness and that it's absolute and unchangeable. And to get back to this phrase, right, it preserves and benefits rather than corrupts and dissolves. So it would at least be an argument that, yeah, what you just said, that uh, Bitcoin is a better kind of money because it, mo it, it most implements, or better term, realizes the goodness of money. Yes. And, um, and insofar as that argument is correct, um, and again, uh, we, we, we've talked about it a lot, so I won't, I'm not trying to bring that whole discussion up, up yeah. again. I'm, I'm giving you, I'm saying like, it's, it's a good proposal, right? Insofar yes. as that yeah. argument is correct, then what, you, what you, you, you basically said is there is, you know, a moral obligation to move, uh, to change our currency in that way. So if you think that uh, currency is, or money is a, uh, is a binder, an integrator of civilization, and then there is, there are um, instances of money that are closer to the platonic form as we have been talking about it here, then you have a moral argument as to why a, a, a change of currency should be made. Now I have one, this is a digressive question. I think we covered it before, um, which is, do you think that money is I mean, well, money is obviously not necessary to civilizations because we had all the Bronze Age civilizations. Right. It's indispensable, money. not necessary. It's indispensable, not necessary. Do you think that, it, and, and, and I, I agree with that, do you think that indispensability is irremovable or is it possible that society or civilizations could be reorganized that we go, not pre-money, I'm not saying that, but we go post-money? Is that, is that I, I, that's an open question. I don't have any I don't have any ideas one way or the other. I'm asking you what you think about that. Um, that would be, I mean, obviously a speculation because we've never <laughs> seen that yeah, at all. Yeah, yeah, yes. yes. The, the only, I guess the only comment I could make that might be helpful is the same, you could say the same question almost by saying, are we ever going to get post scarcity, post economic scarcity? Because right, so long right. as there's economic scarcity, you're going to need, you have to resolve disputes over scarce resources. Ultimately, you can do that with contract or conflict, right? You can fight over it or you can have a contract, yeah, yeah. which money is basically just a social contract. 
yes, yes, yes. Yeah. that along with the rule of law and all these other things, property rights, etc. But if we ever invented, you know, I don't know, like free energy or zero point energy or almost free energy, that economic scarcity could go. I don't think it ever goes away completely because you know the human want, human heart has unlimited wants, right? You could yeah, give us everything right. imaginable. We probably still want more, but you could take yeah. it to where it's almost non-existent. And at that point, money might just lose its relevance to a, a large extent because you just, right. I don't know, we'd have some, I mean, it would be one heck of a breakthrough though. I don't know what this would be like. Um, well, it's a Star Trek universe. I get it. Yes, right. yes, basically that, yeah. 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 All right. So can uh, we get wanna... post money? I would say, yeah, if we can, to the degree we can get post scarcity, we could get post money. Right. Right. Okay. I, I just wanted yeah. to ask you that question. It's interesting yeah. what you had to say. I, no. We don't have to stick to digression. I just wondered. Yeah. I appreciate it. It's a good question. Um, fun to think about, but we got, we have a ways to go as they say. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm going to jump to, <clears throat> I'm on page 114 now. And this is the about the non-opposition between the absolute and the relative, which we've sort of touched on yeah. a few times. Um, right. And that's, again, that's that's liberating this distinction from the two worlds mythology mm -hmm. in a profound way, a really yes. profound way. Yes, indeed. So I'll read this one except here. Schindler writes, logically, while the relative is in some sense opposed to the absolute, the absolute is not in turn opposed to the relative, but inclusive mm. of it. Yes. Likewise, then, if being represents the intrinsic goodness of a thing, then appearance is its relative goodness. Yes. Goodness for others. Right. And by the same token, while appearance is in some respect opposed to being, being is not opposed to, but rather inclusive of appearance. Yes. On the, he goes on to write, on the basis of these considerations, we receive what seems to be a novel way of reading Plato's remarkable statement that the good supplies truth to the thing known. Yes. And he goes on to write, if this inference is justified, then to say that the good bestows truth on things, therefore means that it is precisely the good that establishes the difference between being and appearance and this is um but he goes on to write this is not the only benefit of the good it also grants to the knower the power to know yes um so this is kind of one of the main points I, actually I'm, let me just read two more excerpts and i think this will wind it out thus to say that goodness gives things truth and gives the knower the ability to know means that there is one thing that simultaneously anchors things in themselves as real yes. and yes. opens them up to others. In a word, the good simultaneously opens an absolute distinction between being and appearance and bridges that gap. Yes. It therefore yes. unifies being and appearance without reducing them to one another and can be said at the same time and for the same reason to be the proper measure of the relationship. This is where, yeah. I mean, where you're just running into this paradox repeatedly, but it's simultaneously, I guess this would be the, I forget which way the procession and, and reversion, but separating being and appearance and then also well, bridging them back together. Well, let's go to the through line. Mm -hmm. The through line is non, is absolutely non-reducible to any of the aspects or perspectives or instances, right? So it's absolutely non-reducible. But the through line is precisely that which integrates them together so they exist, so they have existence, and also so that they are intelligible to you, so that you can make sense, that you can follow through the appearance and start to trace out the being of the thing. And now we are saying that appearances can be disclosing of reality, and that, of course, is also the beautiful which is why you love it. And, and this mm -hmm. is how the true and the good and the beautiful are now all coming together. So that's how it both, you know, it, 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 it simultaneously gives the in itselfness 
right? Because the through line is that which is not any particular aspect, and the aspect is how it is good for us. The through line is it's in itselfness that gives it its realness, but it also at the same time and, and makes it it makes this a being, a thing, but it also is what threads those together so that they it, it makes sense to us. It's intelligible to us. Our intellect can grasp it in a way that it, we can find it meaningful such that we can make claims about it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That, 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 yes, no, yeah. it's beautiful. And the thing that comes up for me, again, <laughs> Pearl's book, Theophany, where he gets yeah. into symbols and how they simultaneously conceal and reveal. Yes, yes, yes. And so th does being then, or maybe appearances, maybe both, I'm not sure. Is there some symbolic nature to this? Well, that's exactly, oh, that's exactly it. The, the right, uh, is, <clears throat> right, the Eidolon and the Eidos, right? And, and the idea that, um, uh, the, 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 the aspect can become an idol in which the aspect claims or and makes a claim upon us to be the whole, right? To be, right? Right? To be the source of the being of the thing. Or it can be an icon in which it is trying to be good to us, relevant to us, but also challenge us to see that there is something beyond that aspect. There is actually, right, the melody of all the aspects and the harmony between all the melodies, except you know, of, right. of the perspectives and et cetera, and et cetera. So exactly. So part of what happens when you adopt a Neoplatonic way of understanding in this, like, and where understanding is not just an intellectual project, but this existential mode, the loving, right? The binding, the religion, the ratio religio, right? Is you, you come to see the world symbolically. This is Jonathan Pajot's big argument, mm -hmm. uh, uh, right? Is that, and, and you have to understand that he doesn't mean what we typically mean by symbol. And, and this is what you're putting your finger up. Normally when we do a symbol, we say how this, stands for this right and they're just two different things and it's right but that's not what he means he means exactly what you said no no what we're talking about is how any aspect or right any presentation any appearance is actually a doorway to right the the the, the through line the form the idos now right. that's the revealing how is it concealing it's concealing because we, we, we think in aspects, we think in, right? We, we, we think in aspects, we think in perspectives, we think in categories. And the symbol is also concealing because it has to come into our world, into our perspective. So a way of thinking about it is, a symbol is something that you readily invite into your perspective, but it, it tries to blow you out of and call you ecstasis, call you beyond any perspective. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, it's so what it's a uh, again a, a symbol. It's kind of like hmm, what am I trying to say here? It's so rationality is all everything we're using to compute, right? It, computational knowledge, I think, as you said the other day, that's all relational r relativistic yes. to some extent, yeah. but the, the symbol itself, maybe, maybe multiple symbols and contextual, like I'm just reminded here of this quote. I don't know how to say it this long winded way. So I'll say it the short way artists use lies to point to deeper truths. So there are these little useful fictions of symbols that we know aren't the thing, but I guess they're maybe performing some type of data compression on the thing that we can't, you can't see so, goodness or the whole. So you end up seeing through symbols. And I don't like my, my question would be is, is there then our very cognitive 
machinery symbolic as well or are we just extending okay it so we, we have to be really careful because the word symbolic in cognitive science means precisely computational because mm. the word symbol is just this relationship right um it, it's the it, it's basically uh that we have like mathematical symbols that stand for propositions and stuff like that that's not what we might call a religious symbol, mm -hmm. ratio religio, that mm -hmm. tries to bind us, symbol on, to connect, to join, tries to bind us to a world that we are, are not yet in and, and tries to call us beyond. And so that it might sound odd, but, but try to go with the uncanniness. Your relationship to your beloved is in that sense symbolic. Not that she stands for something or she's assigned for something, but that, right, you are always trying to see through in both senses of the word of beyond, but by means of the appearances that she is generating. That's what phenomenon means, the shining. So right. she, there's, there's a way in which she's always shining to you, but you're always trying to see back through the shining to what is always, right, receding and withdrawing, hmm. right, from you. In, in 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 that sense and so it's it, it it's it, it's important to realize that 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 to well like jonathan says symbolism happens it's not you just using one thing to point to another it is you being bound up ratio religio in this process of ecstasis that is both reason drawing you to the whole, love drawing you to the whole, the way intelligibility is unifying and holding things without totalizing them for you. So oh, oh, here's a metaphor. The symbol simultaneously reveals and conceals because it's translucent. It's like I can simultaneously see my lens and see through them. And being able to see them, right, allows me to become aware of how the medium might be just but i also can see through it and realize that right right realize by means of it to something deeper so symbols are translucent in that sense yeah no that that lands well and i skipped to this earlier but since you said that that um it ha you said it happens i think you said symbols That's happen. Jonathan. jonathan's uh, jonathan pajot tries to get at this and he would not object to this i believe very strongly uh he tries to get to this Neoplatonic notion of a symbol by saying symbolism happens. Mm -hmm. We participate in it and it has a life of its own if you properly understand the nature of a symbol. Right. And this, this is back on page 99. He describes, this is Schindler, describing how truth happens. He says yes. it is not that truth is simply there and then it is received by the soul to give rise to understanding. Instead, truth along with the understanding happens as something yes. the soul co-generates in the coupling yes yes and this is to your point about schindler is again and again emphasizing the transjectivity throughout all of this totally totally and for me so here's you know the the, the mic drop moment maybe or something or uh, right transjectivity is the through line between subjectivity and objectivity right see that's where and again back to the Persig and Leela, that was his whole notion of dynamic quality being something yes, superordinate yeah. to subject object. Yeah. Yes, the, exactly. You got you have to read the book sometime. I agree that I, I don't know the deal with him and Plato. They come to like the same conclusions, but he's sort of pushing back against what I haven't figured that part out because I don't know enough about Plato. But the the vignettes and the language and the way he describes yes. it, it's really, really profound. Um, I, I, I believe so. And I, I mean, I've read portions of it and I've been in, in discussion with Sevilla uh, King about it. You, you, you should, uh, if you're a Persic fan, uh, you should, t you should go on her channel or, or sometime because she is the person bringing Persic to life and creating, I, and I mean this, a philosophical community around Persic's work. Yeah. No, we've, I've actually uh, traded notes with her several times um we've talked yeah online and offline so i i do look i, I look forward to having her on the channel and just talking through the whole book yeah. but um yeah. i think yeah i you'll appreciate it whenever you and i'm sure you've got a long reading list but whenever you get around to it um 
Okay, I will jump forward again. I think this is really important and we don't have a ton of time left, but um, maybe to conclude the point on the goodness, I really like this line. Schindler wrote, goodness as what relates things most properly to themselves and to others is yes. therefore perfective unity. Yes. And I thought that just summed up all the different approaches really yes. nicely. Yes. Yes. And, um, you know, this, it, it, I guess that points back to the logos to some extent that it's kind of the, yes. the unifier yes. of the knower and the known. Yep. And, you and, know, and, and yes, yes. God, very is much. The, God is the word. God is logos. The logos is good. Yes. God is good. It, all these yeah. things yeah. sort of come together. Yes. Um, but now we should probably jump ahead a little more because this is important to talk about the cave, the yes. divided line, yeah. and the nature of appearance, which this, you know, he draws on this, uh, the rest of the book. So let me just see what I should read here. Uh, I'm just going to read a couple of these excerpts. I'm not, I'm just jumping in. I'm not sure which ones are going to be relevant or not. <laughs> I guess we'll realize it as we go. Uh, in book 10's discussion, Plato defines art as an imitation of appearance that aims at the appearance of the appearing thing as appearing. Yes. In other words, the lowest level of the divided line depicts yes. not just the physical appearance of things, but appearance ness as such, the very phenomenality of things considered in their phenomenality as distinct yep. from the object of which it is the appearance. Yes. The lowest level, we might say, presents the perfection of appearance. Um, sorry, I should pause us right there. Would you mind, because I realized we just jumped into the divided line in the cave. There yep. might be people that don't know what the hell we're talking about. Um, are you comfortable just setting up the, the cave and talking about the divided line and uh, it's relevant to everything we've been talking about. Okay. Uh, so the divided line is a, a model Plato uses uh, for, sort of for the different levels of knowing it, it, as they are bound to uh, different levels of reality or understood as realization in both the sense of the making of the things and the making of their knowability, their intelligibility. Uh, um, and so... And, and, and then what Plato does is he, 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 he or like the arts are uh, at, the, at the lower realm and then he puts various things and there's, there's mathematical knowledge is higher up. And then at the top is, is dialectic, um, uh, which is the ability to do this with what we're doing here, to trace out the good in logos and, 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 and be caught up in how that tracing can take on a life of its own that discloses it, like following the logos, like it's Socrates says, like the wind, so that we, the logos becomes bound to the project of disclosing and not just in thought, but in our fundamental connectedness to ourselves, each other and the world, disclosing the relationship between being and appearance. So the divided line is these kinds of knowledge um, and, and the relationship they have to each other. And, and one of the ways it could be misread is by indicating the two worlds mythology. But many people have tried to argue more recently is though it's not positing two worlds, it's actually positing, like we've been talking about this continuum, the transcendence into um, the different, the different, the way in which different powers, the proper proportioning of your cognition and your attention disclose different dimensions of reality and you can loop them such that the disclosure of dimensions can right help to integrate your psyche and help it therefore be less self-destructive self-deceptive mm. and insofar as it then does that it has the capacity to see more deeply into to realize more deeply and then that can internalize, and that loop, that reciprocal opening loop, mm. that I would argue is what Plato is portraying in his parable of the cave. You have individuals that are bound in a world in which they are coerced by being enchained <coughs> to constantly mistaking 
shadows and echoes for the real things that cause the shadows and the echoes. Uh, and this is because in the cave, they are bound to look at a wall and behind them there's a fire and the fire is casting shadows of objects and people are talking and sort of clanking the objects around and there are echoes coming off the wall of the cave. So people are looking at the cave as if it is real. So they are, they are not looking through the appearances to the, their origins. Somebody gets free, plausibly Socrates, right? Uh, turns around and then sees that the shadows and the echoes are asymmetrically dependent. Remember, we talked about that yesterday, are asymmetric. So the intelligibility of the shadows and the echoes depends on the intelligibility of the objects and the voices, not vice versa, right? And so, and then they see the fire that is casting the shadows. And then by, by seeing the fire, they then start to notice a path. And then the path takes them up. And they have to stop progressively because as they're going up the path, they're being subjected to light, light standing for exactly what we're talking about here, right? That intelligibility, right? And, and so think about what's going on here. The light blinds them, then their eyes accommodate and then they can step forward and then the light blinds them and their eyes accommodate this. This is this loop. And what's happening is it's reciprocally opening so that they can actually go up into the opening. And then they have to repeat the cycle because they're in the, the real world right now. They're no longer in the matrix, right? And, and notice how the moving up can start to also move you towards the two worlds of mythology. But <clears throat> anyways, he's up there, there, he or she is up there he, she, or they, I don't want to uh, be specific. It's up there <clears throat> and they can't, first of all, they're blinded and then, right, and then the, their eyes accommodate. And then because of that, they start to see reflections of the sun and they can't actually directly look at the sun, but they try to find the through line through all the reflections so they can get a good sense of the sun as the source of both life and light, the source of both the life of things, their existence for themselves, because that's what life is, existence for itself right? And, right, the, the, the way they can appear, right, to, to each other, the source of life and light. Um, and then they try to take all of this back down into the cave. Uh, that's the ascension and return. And, and, and Schindler takes great pains, very appropriately so, to remind people, and this is, again, a way of undermining the two worlds of mythology, that the return into the cave is just as important as the ascent out. The, re the return to the one is just as important as the procession into the appearances, because it is that, it's literally a path. It's literally the through line between the two in Plato's Republic. And the, 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 it's, it's called an allegory. I think that's a mistake. I think it's, uh, uh, other people call it a parable or a myth. Um, I think parable is the best way of referring to it. That's why the parable of the cave is so justifiably famous. Now notice, notice a tension between these two, which Schlindler brings out, that the parable of the cave is a work of art, completely, utterly. It is a work of imagery and narrative and fiction. And yet Plato had put that at the bottom, right, of the, you know, of the divided line, right? And what, isn't that a performative contradiction? If art is so potentially right, distracting and, and distorting, then why is Plato relying upon it when he is most crucially trying to present us with an account of the good? And I think that is very, very telling because what, other, what people have argued is that Plato is emphasizing in the divided line a continuity rather than a like a, 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 a divided schema. The divisions are in order to help us understand the through line. It's literally a through line. Um, but Plato is. Schindler argues is ultimately not contradicting himself, 
because he thinks that there is a way in which in dialogue, these two, right, the, the, the argumentative and the narrative can, and the drama can be properly wedded together such that the appearances are properly proportioned in a ratio religio to reality. <laughs> Sorry, that was a long speech, but I was trying to bring it all together. Oh, that was excellent. Yeah, that, I learned a lot from that. <laughs> um, I love the, the eyes adjusting you're describing. Yes. Going yes. up and down because that's, I mean, that is actual reciprocal opening, right? So that is yes, again, yes, very, very, much. very deep physical manifestation of love and perhaps enlightenment. And then the, the divided line, like it's almost maybe a bad name because it is more, it's, it's, tell me if I'm wrong, but it, that, that's supposed to be the line where the sunlight stops going into the cave, right? So there's gradations on it. Is that what he's referring yes. to? It, it, in, in that sense. Yeah. Um, so it's the gradations but, of the through line, maybe. Yes, yes. I'm trying to remember where, was it in this? Was it in Schindler? I, I can't remember with confidence where, uh, no, I think it was in Gonzales in uh, the anthology, New Perspectives on Platonic Dialectic, emphasizing the, con the continuum of the line um, as the more fundamental reality behind the divisions. And we have tended, because of the influence of things like the Two Worlds mythology, to emphasize the divisions and almost as if there's separation there, when of course there's no separation at all, right? Um, the, 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 the thing I want to, again, rem remind people is wisdom is not only the reciprocal opening, because when, when Socrates or whoever it is returns back into the cave, they have to go through another, pro they have to be blinded again. In fact, they can't move around in the cave. But what they have to do, and this is Plato's part, is point is they have to remember such that they can become a symbol on a symbol of that to the people that are in the cave and of course um and and, and schindler is all about how you've read you're reading through the book how socrates is not just speaking he's a symbol on right uh, uh, of right the good throughout yes. the republic he is enacted philosophy basically right? yes yes yeah. yes yes Yes. Yeah, and there's a deep mythological resonance there. Um, but one of the things that comes to mind is, may sound silly, but the, the Dark Knight trilogy where he's going back to Gotham. Yes, he has to be a yes. symbol of justice, right? He can't be a man. Yeah. As a man, he's relative yeah. and fallible and all this. But yeah, as a yes. symbol, yeah. he's closer to the absolute that he's trying to represent. And, uh, and that, is, that is the existential challenge of the Neoplatonic way of life because you always have to be and here's highland's title again you always have to be finite transcendent you have to be that which is trying to exemplify and enact the transcendent without ever losing the pole the, the the that you are a finite fallible falsehood right. foolish being right and that's that's the challenge right and that's why socrates is he will exemplify wisdom, but always deny that he has any complete grasp or knowledge of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Keeping his feet on the ground, so to speak. Yes. Um, I'll read just a couple of more of these excerpts here. Uh, Schindler writes, more specifically, the line in re reference to the divided line designates a particular relation between the soul and reality, a yes. relation with both a subjective and an objective component. Exactly. Plato explicitly states that the segments of the line represent varying degrees of manifestness. Yes. This third yes. segment of the line then lie any intelligible objects, not as known in themselves, but rather as hypothesized for the sake of further conclusions. Yes. And he goes on to write the highest section, though it begins by hypothesizing its intelligible objects, proceeds to confirm these hypotheses and thus eliminate their hypothetical character by grasping them in relation to what Plato calls the unhypothetical first principle of everything, the good. Exactly. 
And he finally goes on to write, the line divides not only the sensible and the intelligible, but more specifically, phenomenality and intelligibility as such. Yes. Um, really good stuff. And I'll, I'll read one more here too. Those at the bottom of the cave are the spectators of the images of images, which means yeah. they view things as severed from all contact with reality. Yes. In this sense, the content of their experience is purely conventional, without roots, as far as they can possibly be aware. Plato depicts them as prisoners. Yes. Um, and I just the images on images thing. I, he, the um, I think he goes on to write that they're like participating in their own imprisonment, something to that effect. But um, yeah. Well, think of social media. Think of, think of Twitter and TikTok, right? Yeah. And 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 how that's imprisoning people. They th they think they have absolute freedom of choice and communication, but they are they are right mistaking these images for reality, and that is actually undermining people's mental health. We're mm. now getting increasing evidence for this. So while they think. They are exercising their freedom. This goes back to our freedom discussion. They are actually imprisoning themselves because they are actually undermining their capacity to think and reflect and to connect as they are suffering increasing anxiety, depression, and a, a an undermining of their attentional capacities. Right. No, that that definitely makes sense. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up a technology because I, I was going to take this towards money that, you know, the dollar was an image of gold basically yeah, for a long yes, time. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, all right. I hadn't thought and, about that. And then Actual we go shape. yeah. Well then yeah. we go off the gold standard. So now you have an image of the image of the gold backed right. dollar, which was an image of right. gold. And right. now what is this creating? Like it's creating this imprisonment where people I think you you had like you said, you think you have all this freedom, right? You have a lot of dollars in the bank account. Yeah. And unless you're in Sri Lanka and you wake up the next day and all of the bank accounts are frozen or yes. they've inflated yes. or whatever, like it's you've just abdicated all of this responsibility without knowing it. Um, and so oh. you, you, you become imprisoned in this false reality. And it's something about that, I guess how far divorced the image is from the underlying reality. That is the magnitude of the imprisonment. And that's where the icon darkens it loses translucency and becomes the opaque idol right that you are now looking at rather than looking through very yes. much that's what what plato is trying to to get at the the thing i would I, robert i don't want to disrupt the flow but i really i, I want to make sure we've given I mean, we've touched on it again and again but maybe i could request like i, I really want to make you know have we really shown the the complete interdependence interpenetration of you know of reason and love with respect and, and so we've got the interpenetration of intelligibility and goodness and then we and, and that and that is that is enacted and and, and 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 participated by the complete interpenetration of reason and and love because the the, the schindler is trying to show how right and, and 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 by the way this is also in in, in spinoza i'd like to point out this to people because Spinoza is the most logical of philosophers, but he repeatedly argues, right, that reason cannot find blessedness on its own. It needs love precisely because love is the ecstatic component of reason. It is that which calls us beyond any particular frame, any particular idolization we've mm -hmm. made of any particular theory or construct or per ego centric perspective, right? Love is the ecstatic element of reason insofar as reason is reaching for the whole. Mm -hmm. Love, yes. reason are interpenetrating. And, and, and for me, this is one of the great, great claims of Plato because it completely gives you an understanding of how contemplative rationality is different from computational rationality, which is different from communicative rationality. Yeah, no, it's excellent point. Maybe we can 
let's try to get through because at the end of the chapter goes into this. So I'll just read a few excerpts. Um, right. Schindler writes, well, in a, he writes a number of things. Love thus proves to be an indispensable aspect of coming true to knowledge. Yes. Uh, well, sorry, that, that was kind of conclusive. Let me back up and read one that might feed into that a bit more. So shorting, uh, Schindler writes, according to Nalan Ranasinghe, the cave is nothing more or less than the absence of a certain generosity in one's disposition toward reality and grace. Yes. He goes on to write, liberation, in other words, is the movement from a sheer self-centered view of reality to a bonocentric view. Right. And we'll come back to that word. To put it another way, it is a movement from the reduction of a thing to its relation to me, to seeing it as existing in its own right, as good yes. in an absolute sense, which to say it yet again, includes its being good for me without being limited to that mode of goodness. Yes. What brings about this movement? If the good in its twofold nature is what establishes the difference between being and appearance, it is also the bridge between them, as we said earlier. Yes. yes. We wish to suggest that love grows precisely because it is set on a single object that has a twofold nature, which is the good. The movement beyond the visible image nevertheless draws on the first impulse towards the image because it is one and the same good that is its source. Um, let's see, goodness. Okay. I wanted to get to this defining love as an absolute. So just a couple more as Iris Murdoch once put it, love is yeah. this. Difficult... I love this. It's one of my all time favorite quotes, by the way, so go ahead. <laughs> as Iris Murdoch once put it, love is the difficult realization that something other than oneself is real. Yes. In, in the sophist. Plato suggests that the life experience one endures as one gets older aids in grasping reality beyond appearances and words. This is why Plato describes the philosopher's education, not merely in terms of purely intellectual subjects to be learned, but also as the radical discipline of an ordered way of life, which involves an unstinting love of the whole. He insists yes. on the comprehensive love of labor that is required for its success. And just a couple of more short ones here. Love is self-transcending of its very nature because it aims at what lies beyond mere relativity to the self. And uh, Diatima insists that the whole of which love is ordered transcends mere relativity to the self precisely because it is absolute. Yes. So we get to this kind of deep connection between love and goodness. And, um, you know, another thing that just occurred to me is I've also heard love is described as like the unity of opposites, right? It's where all these opposites come together. Yeah. And that seems to be related to the absolute being transcendent through the relative rather than above the relative. So it's actually yes. again un yes. back to unity, right? It's unifying yeah, these. Yeah. Yeah, yes, you know, exactly. The yeah. the opposites, right? The things you would think are furthest apart somehow come together inside of love. Yeah. And that, so the Neoplatonist Nicholas of Cusa um, w w w really endeavored, uh, and he called learned ignorant learned ignorance, meaning both learned and learned, worthy of uh, honor, um, is exactly the place where through love we can see. The coincidence of opposites but we can't actually grasp it in logical thought um, and so uh, when you can turn a contradiction into a paradox that becomes an icon through which you grasp the, those non-logical identities that's what kuza is talking about. and that again is a symbol right um right because right. a symbol is binding things that are opposite to each other the way we've talked about it. But uh, think about the, the, the Murdoch quote, love is the difficult realization that something other than yourself is real. You could take out the word love and put reason in there and it would still absolutely work. But it only works for contemplative reasons because computational reason 
is not dialectical. It is not about stepping outside. The you can do, you can be completely computationally rational while staying within your egocentric perspective. Remember Hume? It's no dip, you can't give any reason why, why I should prefer, you know, the destruction right. of the whole world over the, uh, just the you know, the, the scratching of my finger, right? But if you understand the contemplative idea of ratio religio, then you see that it, it is also love and that love, right, is properly what is needed for reason. And, and when love is like ratio religio, it's going to be a wise thing. I, 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 and I, I happen to think, I happen to think that all sin, which is more than just being immoral, but you know, being constitutionally, ba constitutionally bound to self-destruction, all sin is ultimately the failure to love wisely. Hmm. Right? If you, to, to love things proportionately, right? Um, so, you know, and, and the Christian Platonists did a lot of work on this. Um, the, the idea of, well, uh, how, like, how, how much should you love your spouse? How much should you love your children? How much should you love them in comparison to how, how you love God? And how what how what and and you realize oh these are really interesting uh, intellectual questions but they're not just intellectual questions they're actually existential questions how do I properly proportion all of this out and so um, I you know you, you understand that you want to see not only um, the love that's in reason you want to see the reason within love but the, because we have made love. Um, well, romantic in, in, in a pejorative sense, in a degenerative sense, where it's a, a, a sort of compulsive feeling, um, we, 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 we misframe love from being able to see it as this existential mode. But if you think about it carefully, love is not a feeling. Um, I mean, I love Sara, my partner, very deeply right now, but I, like, I, I, I'm not having any, I was, while I'm talking to you, I'm not having any particular feeling happening. And it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't point to a particular emotion because my love for her can make me happy, can make me sad, right? Can make me jealous or angry. Like it, it, it's not, it's not, it's definitely not a feeling. It's definitely not an emotion. It's an existential mode. It's this ratio religio, right? Right. The, the reciprocal opening. But so it's difficult for us to see the interpenetration of love and reason, not only because we have an impoverished notion of reason, but because we have an impoverished notion of love. When we, when we re-enrich our notion of love and re-enrich our notion of reason, we see how they deeply interpenetrate. That's an amazing point. Uh, the quote that kept springing to mind was the heart knows no, the heart knows no reason, right? So our, maybe our impoverished conception of love sort of yes. co originates this impoverished conception of reason or vice versa. I'm not sure, but um, I, I, I think that's right. I, I wanted I, to just highlight um, one that we, this word came up in one of the excerpts earlier, bonocentrism. Yes. It just says in a footnote here, we are speaking in other words of a bonocentrism, which is neither self-centeredness, nor other centeredness, but rather asymmetrically both at once. Yes. And I mean, there it is right there. That's transjectivity, right? It's not yeah, yes, the center yes. is somehow in between, yeah. not, yes, not yes. in any one yes. thing. Yes. Um, sorry, did I interrupt you? No, I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I think you can interchangeably also use uh, bonocentric and ontocentric, where onto means being, in the way we've been talking about here, both what makes something to be, but also what makes it be knowable mm. to us, and, and keeping them all bound together. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to read just a couple more excerpts before we run out of time here to try to get through love. He writes, and <clears throat> it is a madness because rooted in the absolute and in itself goodness of things, it cannot ultimately be justified and thus explained by anything beyond itself. Um, 
Can I just Sorry. interject there? Yes, please. That's that's Socrates, that's Socrates returning back into the cave. Mm. He seems mad to the people when he tries to talk to them. Oh, okay, right. right. Because he is uh, enlightened or yes, something. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and this is the I, I should have said that it we're now speaking to the ecstatic character of platonic love. Yes. Um, and he goes on to write, as we suggested in the previous chapter, any description of something is by definition limited to the describable qualities of a thing. Yes. Words can only say something about a thing. They cannot say the thing itself. Yes. They, they concern being as it appears rather than being as it is beyond any manifestation. And yes. yet, as we have seen, truth requires precisely this a grasp of the reality itself, which is beyond relation and thus beyond description. To yes. communicate such a truth will require more than words. What lies in this realm, the teleos of love, is really real reality. Yes. Which is colorless, figureless, and non-appearing. And yes. I think that flows into what we are talking about earlier, that, that Socrates can't just articulate philosophy yeah he has yes. to enact it he has to be it right that, that ultimately grounds out in praxis yes yes yeah. exactly so he has to symbolically enact it and be it I, I just wanted to uh another great masterpiece is nishitani's religion and nothingness mm. and he defines religion as the real self-realization of reality could you say that one more time? I'm sorry. The real self-realization of reality. So we participate in a profound kind of realization that is one with the self-realization of reality. So there is no, there is no, there is, a, there is a conformity. There is no separation between our fundamental self-realization and the self-realization of reality. It goes back to Spinoza's point, how we participate, right, right, in God or nature in a profound way. I think that answers the question I asked yesterday is like, are we talking about what's in here or what's out there? It's they're, yeah. they're one and the same, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, 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 and again, Nishitani says that, and I, I, I would put religion and not, nothingness in, in, in the top five books I have read in my life mm. for the philosophical and transformative profundity. The fact that he defines that as religion and he's really talking about religio and he is also using realization in the double sense that I use, mm. I got it from him, mm -hmm. right? That's the ratio religio we've been talking about from the very beginning. And many people may say, well, that's not what organized religion is. Maybe so, but that's not what we're, that's, but we're talking about something that is this coupling to reality in a way that brings us into a reverential attitude mm. and meta optimal grip with respect to it. Mm. Yeah. Well said. Well said. Um, okay. Uh, five more minutes here and I promise I'll let you go. There's so many good quotes in this chapter. Shinla writes here, being is at once the noun adverb and verbal predicate. It thus represents a perfect unity, which can nevertheless be differentiated into various aspects, yes. designating not only the thing itself being, but also, I'm sorry, but what it does also being, and how it is doing it, being Lee. Yes. It is precisely this that Plato meant by saying that the good is the most precise measure. It allows an objective perspective because it demands a transcendence of all partiality. Yes. Um, uh, okay, one more here. To be sure, we must keep in mind that the twofold nature of goodness is never lost. The absolute identification with the beloved object does not eliminate a relative difference from it. The self-transcendence of Eros is thus not the loss of the self but rather a forgetting of the self and a focus on what is good. Even yes. while that goodness, if it is good, will always necessarily include a goodness for the self. Think about the flow state as, a, as an example of just exactly that. 
Mm. The shining forth, the sense mm. of ongoing discovery. You're forgetting the, the egocentric narrative, the, all, that all falls silent, and you are reciprocally opening, and there's a kind of profound loving that is going on there. But it is also a profound improvement of one's cognitive ability to grasp the world. At least I argued that when I've done a, you know, generated with Leo Ferraro and, uh, and Arian Hera Bennett, a cognitive theory of what's happening in flow. Yeah, you're you're at peak performance, right? So, but you're also at peak. You're at peak realization. You're at peak experience. Peak experience. It, it, yeah. It, yeah, it's all of these things happening at the same time, and you're and you're receiving a kind of evolutionarily designed reward precisely because you are evolving your adaptivity in a powerful and exemplary way. And what is it so in that it demands a transcendence of all partiality? Is that, are we just restating the absolute nature of the good in another way again? That it, it's but he's trying to remind you, right, how He's trying to remind you of the inherently dialogical nature of it. I would argue that what what that we can only really do this to the degree to which we are open to other perspectives and not willing to settle on any perspective as the culmination or the uh, or, or the grasping of what we are, we are seeking. So we are loving towards all perspectives but we are loving through them, hopefully in a shared manner to what they are all pointing towards, but which they can never completely ever grasp. So in internalizing perhaps the understanding that it's an ever receding horizon. Um, it's an ever receding horizon, but we are like, we, we, we really need each other uh, in order to do this well. Remember when we talked about yesterday, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, dialogical rationality supersedes uh, individual rationality mm. in, in many, many important ways. Uh, I think one way I like to think of it, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a clean uh, right, division. So take this heuristically, not sort of completely. But I think of individual rationality as how we overcome, you know, uh, being bound, being sort of locked how we overcome idolizing any one aspect mm -hmm. and the degree to which we've internalized other people's perspective. We are now already moving to dialogical rationality in which, right. We are using dialogue and the collective intelligence of distributed cognition to overcome the idolization of any one perspective or subset of perspectives. Wow. Yeah. No, that speaks directly to the importance of the actual economic market process. And um, my, my three and a half year old said something to me yesterday. She goes, what would happen dad, if, if you touched the sunset, oh. I, I was like, you know, you thought about it for a minute and you're like, Oh, you just end up kind of chasing the sunset yeah. around the world because it's, you yes. know, horizon yes. dependent. And, um, Oh, that's very good. I like that. Especially but, if you think about Plato's use of the sun as the symbol of the good. Yeah. So that's what this, I mean, I don't know the, the, the absoluteness of the good or love. It's like something you never, there's no final destination, right? It's just this eternal pursuit, I guess. Yeah. Um, and that, and that's one criticism and maybe it's, this is not just a criticism of how Plato was taken up but by in the medieval world, but maybe there's some criticism of Plato here. But I, I'm not. I'm unsure of the second part. The idea of you know perfection as completion and, and completion as not the whole, but the to, the the finished total, mm. um, like like the, the the like the final grip, the the final solution. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, I, I can see, in fairness to people who have drawn that, that Plato seems to talk that way at times, but in other places. We, he says we are forever philosophers. We are forever lovers of wisdom. We will never achieve it. We will never get that. We are always in finite transcendence. So I'd like to put aside talking about the sacred in terms of perfection, precisely because 
And I, I, I instead talk about the sacred as an inexhaustible fount of intelligibility rather than as perfection. Beautiful. Well, I think that's a great place to put a button on it. Uh, okay. Really enjoyed this again, and I will see you yeah, back here tomorrow. You. Yes, I look forward to it. Thank you so much for facilitating this, Robert. And thank you, the way you show up in this, like really authentically, you, you make statements, but you're willing to reconsider and readjust. You, you, you enter into genuine dot dialectic and you really afford the emergence of dialogos in this. And I, I wanna thank you for that. It makes this you know, a, a, an instance of exemplifying what we're talking about, not just talking about it. Oh, well, thank you so much. That's, that's a very high compliment from someone like yourself. And um, yeah, this material definitely warrants that approach, I would think. <laughs> exactly. That, yeah. that, 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 that wonderingly confident, but also, you know, resolutely humble stance. Yes. That is exactly the appropriate approach. Yes. Beautiful. All right. Looking forward to the next one. Me too. Take good care, my friend.